the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yep. Ah, uh, we normally open with public comments, but it doesn't look like we have any public to comment. So uh, we can move over to our acceptance of minutes. I have a couple of small edits on the July 7 minutes. Does anybody else have any comments about those minutes? No. No. Uh, my comments are on the first paragraph. The uh, second, third sentences are kind of future tense rather than past tense and maybe we uh, rewrite or just strike them. And then I also have a comment on the second page, the last paragraph discussing uh, Bill Nemzer's introduction. I don't quite understand the sentence about Slockman Capello's comment. Maybe we're just missing a word or something, but it doesn't make much sense to me. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we just strike the, in the first paragraph, strike the second and third sentences. They don't seem to really add much to it. And then on the second page, since I don't really understand what it says, I suggest we strike that last sentence. Selectman Compello added, and then just strike that sentence. Sentiment, as I recall, on that final pair the final sentence was uh, Don was thanking Bill for having basically arranged his schedule to be able to be here to start the night, uh, oh. the day before the hearing that was being held downstairs the next day. That's my recollection. All right, so let's change it to uh, that then. That's fine. And I also would uh, prefer we keep the comment about welcoming Jason. Uh, all right, we just need to change the change the tense, tense. rather than a directive. Very good. Okay, do we have a uh, motion on the minutes of July seven? Move to motion accept. To oh, go ahead. Accept. Oh, do you have a comment, Brennan? No. Oh, motion to accept the minutes of Monday, July seventh, as amended. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comment? All in favor? It was accepted by unanimous vote thank you um, item five correspondence uh, I make a motion that we accept correspondence items a through J as presented in the uh, agenda of August 5th 2014 do I have a second second any further comments all in favor motion passes for nothing uh, we have a consent agenda item do we have a motion on that I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda as Printed in the uh, agenda. We have a motion for the uh, acceptance of the consent agenda. Do we have a second? I guess only subtlety is it's approval versus acceptance because we're actually issuing ah, a permit. Very good. Correct. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Do we have a second? Second. A motion and second. Any further comments? No. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, item seven is a uh, special Jeez. election due to our recent vacancy and I think uh, Kevin is going to explain to us why Tuesday September 30 is an appropriate time thank you mr. chair yeah I've reviewed the timing uh, timeline to uh, for an expedient um, special election to uh, move forward with the vacancy of the member of the Board of Selectmen and um, Based on uh, town clerk's um, advice, uh, looking at the the timeline and everything um, from statute statutory requirements on when an election has to happen or the soonest election can happen within a vacancy of the board, and things like that. That the uh, the recommendation would be to uh, set a. Uh, an election, special election date for Tuesday, um, September 30th, 2014, uh, based on uh, discussions with town clerk as a best date. Okay, I, I note that the charter directs us to do this election forthwith, forthwith. Is this as forthwith as possible. It is. There's some uh, stipulation in statute that actually dictates like a 42 day um, P 
piece and everything. So we, so we, had, we had done out the calendar, and, and uh, that made the most sense. Um, of course, uh, also taking into account the town clerk's uh, obligations for the primaries and other, you know, other elections that are going to be happening. So this is expedient and uh, meets the requirements. Any comments, questions from the board? Yeah, one comment. Uh, it just seems kind of quick for somebody who may want to. What's the plan as far as pulling papers, getting signatures, yeah. et cetera, et cetera? And as soon as uh, the, the board votes on the date, um, the town clerk will be providing me um, with a timeline on the uh, on when that'll happen. She she has to do it out based on what the what the uh, date is set, but she preliminary knows that it's set for the thirtieth and. Um, we'll lay out a, uh, a timeline moving forward. And of course, we'll, we'll make sure that that gets advertised appropriately and it's out there. So that timeline, if we vote tonight, that will be up on the web tomorrow? Ideally, yeah. yeah. Brendan, you had a question? Nope. Well, oh, well yeah, I guess I do. Uh, so, so I guess there's, uh, there was a comment uh, at the last meeting that I made about uh, whether or not the approval of the town charter could coincide with the special election for filling the vacancy on the Board of Selectmen. Um, could you just provide a brief update on that, please? Uh, yes. Discussions with uh, town council at our meeting on Thursday was that um, that needed to happen at an annual election. There's some um, questions of whether or not that, that actually, based on a previous legal opinion, whether it, it indeed needs to be at an annual um, or annual election versus a special election. So we're waiting for definitive answer again from council on that. But I think the um, the uh, opinion that she gave in uh, March to the uh, Charter Review Committee was that it needed to happen. Um, it couldn't happen within two months. Essentially, any time after two months of the um, annual town meeting, which would allow for it to happen now. But my but most recent conversation was that it had to happen at an annual. Why did that so change? Do we have any, any idea? Well, it, does, it, it just says at the next, I think it says at the next annual or next election, it doesn't say annual or special. The, the legal opinion is ambiguous. Yeah, it, it doesn't specifically state. Now, the preference of the board is that it happen at the same time. Is that I would correct, that. guys? I would concur. Yeah. And so. If it can, it will. And right. Can't, it won't. The, the question, though, then becomes: Do we need to formally declare a an election for the charter on date specific? No, we'll formally declare the uh, special I know, election. I, I, date. We have the form. We and have then, the formal declaration of the special election. Right. But do we also have to say? And by the way, we'll do we that. Are we'll also, do that at our, our next. And we have enough time in the, in the interim to do yeah. that. All right, any other comments? I can make a motion. You could. I move to call a special election on September 30th, 2014. Okay, we have a motion for uh, requesting a special election Tuesday, September 30. I'll, uh, do we have a second? Second. We have a second? All right. Uh, is it necessary to specifically state what the election is for? No. No, fine. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further comments? All in favor? Votes for nothing. Motion passes. We have an election on Tuesday, September 30. More to come tomorrow. More details tomorrow. Um, the next item is our calendar of meetings for the remainder of the fiscal year. And for some reason, I have hard copies for you. Thank you. Put this up on your fridge. Uh, two notes here. The um, I'm pretty sure the what would typically be a meeting scheduled for uh, Tuesday, November four, is being suggested as Wednesday, November five, because of the conflict with the uh, state election. That's right, isn't that correct? Okay. And then. Um, do we have the same conflict with the date we just set for yes. September 30th? That does seem to be that. Yeah. And, and that September 30 and a couple of the other ones were um, my promise to you for the uh, meetings on the fifth Tuesdays of the month. 
and uh, so we kind of got a conflict on September 30. So, uh, could I make could I make another comment? So, so, um, so I I request the board consider striking um, any date that falls on an election. Um, so that would be the fifth and the thirtieth, which we were just discussing. Well, the fourth, the fifth takes away the conflict. I'm sorry, thank you for pointing that. So, anyways, and then the other one would be December thirtieth, since I think I don't know what my Christmas vacation plans are, but between, <laughs> I'm not really thinking I'm gonna want to go to a board of selectmen meeting between Christmas and New Year's. Well, that does leave us with a three-week window or longer without action. I acknowledge that's, that fact. I, I wouldn't want it on the 24th either, or whatever the week the week before is. I think town calls probably close that week too, right? Uh, partial. I, I forget what the holiday schedule is. Uh, it's just a half before Christmas. And oh, sorry. My bad. Okay. Um... All right, so as far as this calendar. But I'm one, I'm one member. That's just my request. I, I agree. I don't think it's wise to have a meeting on December 30th or on December whatever it would be, 23rd. All righty. Um, so I think we got our calendar set for regular meetings. Um, as printed here, except uh, a drop in September and December 30. So, w w would you entertain a motion? Do we or need a motion? Do you need a motion? Do you care? Do you want a motion? No. Then okay. Scrap that. We'll just finalize it. Now for it. Post it. It just said approval. So. Yeah. Chairman, did I miss the comment section? You did. Oh shucks. Can I make one quick one? Uh, hang on a second. Let me figure this out. You'll indulge me. Um, yeah, it's it's okay. I, sure, what go I ahead. would like to say is I I think the town, somewhere or other, the board or somebody, should write a letter to the owners of McDonald's restaurant on our Main Street, and tell them that they brightened the corner, and I, you know. It's only going to take a sheet of paper or not that much time, but I think I think they've done a hell of a job down there as far as making that corner look very beautiful when people come in on one of those main roads. I'm just chuckling. Uh, it won't, won't hurt to give them a pat in the back, you know. There's not much difference between a pat in the back and a kick in the cranny. It's a short. I'm just chuckling, Mr. Chair, because actually uh, Andrew and I were driving, driving the town today, and I had just actually expressed that same sentiment that uh, be nice to put there should be though. some accolades and I, you know I, mean? I can appreciate that, yeah. Great minds think alike. Because you know, we get, we, get a lot of, we get a lot of negative stuff around here. No, absolutely. And it looks great. They've done a great job with I it. I think we should take time to pat somebody on the back when they do something good. Agreed. Thank you. Appreciate your indulgence. And uh, just a personal uh, remark, I had relatives in town recently and I think the quote was, that's a damn nice looking McDonald's. It's, it is. It really is. They've done a great job. We were just saying that this afternoon. I also note that Middlesex Bank redid their landscaping over by Vic, but uh, yes, kudos to them. Thank you. Um, while we're back into public comments, any further public comments? No? Okay. Um, Item number nine is uh, the uh, Town of Maynard Alcoholic Beverage Licensing Regulations. And this was a topic of a previous meeting discussion. And we had virtually the same markup suggestions from town council on their latest review of these. Uh, the exception was we had questions on the redundancy of sections 18.2 and 3. And so this version confirms that they're redundant and strikes those as well. Okay. Everything else is unchanged since <coughs> our last discussion point. And uh, I think we're looking to uh, get approval of these changes with the realization there's probably other changes that could always be done. But uh, for now, we have these uh, on our desk. 
So I'll open it up for any comments that we might have. Um, Jason, do you got any comments on the, uh, the regs? No, well, I was going to say, I think some of these changes probably predated me. Uh, and I've taken a flip through them, and they, they seem reasonable. Um, I have no major issue on the guidance um, based on what we've, we've talked about previously at the previous meeting. Okay. Brendan? You got any? No comments. David? I'm fine with how it's been rewritten. All right. Would you um, entertain a motion? Uh, yeah. Let me just say... Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna refer to the draft. So I move to approve uh, the Maynard Alcohol Beverage Licensing Regulations as dated July twenty third, two thousand fourteen. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further uh, discussion? No. All in favor? And passes four zero. Thank you very much. All right. Now our uh, chairman, sir. <coughs> doesn't do much good to approve of licensing regulations if they're not enforced. You can have all the regulations you want, but if they're not enforced, they're useless. I sat through a hearing here one night, and it, I was really quite amazed to find how inept and how terrible the thing had been handled, okay? And a few people didn't realize it, there's something wrong with you folks because you were the head of the town and you know it was just a terrible terrible thing i thought okay well thank you for the comment so noted and probably applicable to other things as well um item 10 the uh lay us on assignments to committees and boards um my apologies for failing to figure out how to get something posted on Dropbox, but uh, I have I have your um, preferences for committee assignments, and safe to say that the first two go to David Gavin, the Council on Aging and FinCom, because he was first to prioritize Council on Aging and the only person who wanted to lay us on with Finance Committee. Um, I have a history. Brendan and Jason, uh, you guys both want school committee. Any uh, preferences there? No argument. Okay. You can have it. All right, good. Then I would suggest you also have an overlap on um, CONSCOM and Historical Commission. Maybe Jason would get those. Uh, yeah, I don't, if I don't have a problem with that. I am open to any board. All right, I'm trying to remember what I suggested. I would conservation leave. commission. It is, and Jason. then Brendan only has one so far, and you had cultural council as one of yours. You want that? Yeah, but David wanted it too, right? David did want it, but already gave him two. That's fine. <laughs> uh, you okay with that, David? All right, so we got six of them taken care of so far. <laughs> Um, like seven or eight left. <laughs> Got a lot of nights in the week. I noticed that Jason was uh, had on his uh, list the board of assessors. Are you willing to take that one too? Certainly. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that, by my score sheet, leaves us uh, library, housing authority, board of appeals, board of health, community community preservation committee, recreation. Planning board. I, um, and uh, I mean, we can. I, I'd be happy to pick up some, or uh, we could wait and find out our September 30. But, well, uh, would you like to designate them now and then shed them after the 30th? Yeah, we can designate them. Well, now. I mean, I don't mind. My preference for me, I would probably prefer library and community preservation committee. I so. Um, I don't, I don't take issue with that. I would just offer that as the chair, you have an increased workload, so um, I'm sensitive to that as far as when it comes to just allocating the committees. Well, I was thinking two would be good. No, no, that's fine, <laughs> but I just want to express that sentiment. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, no, I'd, I'd be happy. Library crowd's not too uh, raucous, so I think I can handle that. And community Preservation Committee. 
But we have uh, the other ones. Uh, you don't have to decide now. We could figure it out at our next meeting. But uh, what do you have? Rec, recreation, planning board, board of health, housing authority, board yeah. of appeals. I mean, we had ZBA too, but did we take that off the list? Yeah, I mean, I don't. Because of the type of I mean, interaction with them is pretty simple. So yeah, I don't know that we need to commit manpower to that. And I'm assuming things like um, the economic development committee, you know, since Andrew's participating, we'll just, that will be our liaison. But uh, rec and planning board and board of health maybe and housing authority are the big ones. Uh, I'll, I'll jump on rec. So, um, I don't know how to, I'd welcome your thoughts on how to approach planning board. So I'll put you on the spot. How you think we should approach assigning a liaison to planning board? Yeah. Um, what did we do last time? I think it was David. How'd that work? I think it was me the last time. But the last time we discussed liaison assignments was like two or three years ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, the way, I guess it really comes down to what the role of a liaison is. It's not to in any way try to influence or to do anything other than to gather information and to keep the lines of communication open. Um, certainly not required to attend meetings um, with any regularity. Um, so... Uh, I mean, I guess I'm looking for liaisons to, well, one is to bring back to the board either in person from a chair of the board or their goals and objectives for the year, just so we know, and then just basically keeping us apprised of, of any significant activities for which they might need our assistance. And uh, other than that, it's just, simple check-ins every once in a while oh I think no, I no heavy lifting I'm clear on the roll it's just you know there's there's a lot of recent history with the planning board and so that's why I asked the question the way I did which is your thoughts on on how we could best assign that liaison role would, would you would you if, if you don't want it then don't take it that that's clear but um I don't mind it. I just don't. I'm not looking to. Um, I shied away from the planning board assignment, liaison assignment years ago, and this is pre 129 Parker Street, um, just to avoid a perception of um, conflict or what have you, just because I'd been on the board for so many years. We're obviously many years past that experience, but again, you know, I don't mind taking the role. I just. You know what? I'll, I'll switch recreation for planning board. It's fine by me. That's fine by me. Okay. Sure. And well, we got a couple hanging out there, but uh, we got enough to start with, I think. We can, uh, if and um, comes up, we can talk about it next week. One thing, if we can get from Kevin from your office, is a list to all of us, if available, of the email co contacts, whatever contact we have for the chairs of each of those committees. Yes. So that then we can have their contact info. So yeah, that was going to be yeah, one of my uh, topics at the end of the evening because it would be nice just to get that on Dropbox. So it's available to everybody. Uh -huh. I must do. Okay, um, item number 11, ratification of collective bargaining agreements. My understanding is that they are not quite ready and it's in action on the... Um, Including the one we talked about last time? I believe so. Correct. <laughs> I thought we were like this close. Uh, yeah, we're still waiting um, from La Una, uh, and they need to be properly uh, vetted and reviewed. So. But we're highly hopeful for next meeting? Yeah, we definitely should have it 
at our next meeting. I, um, everything's in place. It's just more of a clerical uh, task at this point. I believe they're pretty much done with it, but we haven't had time to uh, to, to review. Are we, we still don't, good? We don't know if it's properly written or not. Got it. So it's not ready for signature, and we're anticipating approval at our 819 meeting. All right. Oh, very good. Uh, that brings us to um, item number 12, something that we're only about 16 months behind and acting upon. And it's the uh, query about naming of public uh, places in town property. And I believe David has a, a uh, sample for discussion that he stole mostly from Concord, is that correct? That's correct. Um, basically, as you can see, there's a public process involved. Um, you know, and, and this is all extremely rough draft, but just to get something out for discussion, there's no intent to have this uh, formally approved this evening. Um, I think everybody, I don't know if everybody's had a chance to read through it and, and get their thoughts together on it. Um, but there have been there have been requests uh, recently. Um, Mr. Tommel brought a request to us for consideration on the naming of a property, and um, we don't have a policy on it. And clearly, it's something that we we need to have so that if we go forward with naming of public property, we follow uh, guidance that is provided to us and future boards, so that um, there's some consistency and there's some understanding of what the process is maybe so that's how we got here and uh, I apologize to mr. Tommel for and thank him for his diligence and keeping the pressure on me but also in his patience and waiting for me to come up with a with a plan that uh, that we might be able to start having the discussion on um, with that I'll hear any comments I know you don't have a copy of it um, oh, but it doesn't really. can, oh, it's in a packet can, can you can you please give him a written copy? Thank you. Um, can I offer just a couple of cursory thoughts? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so one of which that that the way I read it, and um, is that <coughs> so, for the most part, if I think about uh, town property, and mostly I'm thinking about about buildings and certain grounds, it mo many of them are under the control of the board of selectmen. Some are control, you know, the library is under the control of the library trustees. The school committee, the schools are under nominal control of the school committee, and I can go through the list. It just, I, I guess, I would like to to ensure that I'm there's clarity on if um, if someone was to follow this process and wanted to request the naming of a conference room in the junior in the Fowler School. It, from the way I read this, it has to eventually come to the Board of Selectmen. And is that, is that the intent? Is that prudent? Sort of an open discussion item. Um, I believe it's an exact uh, copy of what Concord does. Oh, no, I, so I, I believe you. As far as the wording goes, that is their intent. Okay. And so is that our intent? Is, yeah. I mean, are we doing this just for our committees? Or are we doing this town wide? You mean our properties. Well, any public. Well, our properties and our appointed committees. Well, it says any public property, such as buildings, da, 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 which includes the right. libraries and the schools Absolutely. and everything. So, and and if this is the policy the board wishes to adopt, then then there has to be certainly a conversation with the the school administration, right, to clarify any potential misunderstandings. I'm just offering that as a potential issue, and then of course. Um, the other the other thought is um, there's you know the the need for a vote of town meeting um, a town meeting vote is a, is a pretty high bar to set so the so the question becomes if it's other than a room um, if you were to name a square a park or something like that is is that a reasonable bar to set to go to have to go to town meeting so the you know the most often that it could happen not ex not that I expect a flood of requests but the most quickly it could happen is twice a year. Right. And, you know, just to, my comment on that point is 
I, I recognize that it's very cumbersome, um, but I like, you know, it can only happen every couple, every six months because it gives plenty of time for thought. And frankly, I think if it's worth naming something after somebody, then that's worth celebrating at town meeting. In addition, it de no, I don't really have a problem with that, but I recognize it's pretty cumbersome. It, it, de it the purpose is to depoliticize it, so that if we have a, an affinity for an individual or a group or a person or a uh, a family or whatever, it's not the five members of the board of selectmen that ultimately have the decision, um, and it's not. Um, there's no favoritism or whatever based on the five members of the board of selectmen. It's based on the 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 will of the town um, because it's town property at the end um, you know just an example so Suppo suppose this board was very high on our current president which obviously is a uh, you know a, a point of conflict and, and we decided we wanted to name one of our parks after the current president if we don't have that t tie in there it's t it's stuck for 20 years and a lot of people might be upset by that so um, I think that you need to, that's the purpose of it, is to have that check and balance so that we're not just giving the political sway of the Board of Selectmen or the opinions of the Board of Selectmen to have control. And I use that example not because I feel one way or the other way about the President, but rather just as an example of a, of a sort of a spark plug name that might come up. No, I think it's actually a fine example. I just, I immediately put the comment out there for discussion and identifying that it's a cumbersome bar, but I think I'm, I mean, I, I actually valid. wonder about, um, you know, why they bring it through the selectmen. I mean, why doesn't the the ownership committee just bring it to town meeting? I mean, why do they do a hearing and then the selectman does it and well, then it goes to town meeting? So, so for ex and again, fostering discussion, right? So we recent, rec relatively recently, meaning what, six, seven years ago, built a new library, and there's obviously a lot of rooms in there, right, um, that were named. And if I read, now they don't have to go to town meeting, but if I was to read this, the library trustees or the friends of the main lib library couldn't have done that. They would have had to done public hearings before the Board of Selectmen. It, it says naming of public, publicly owned property for a person or family except for the naming of rooms within buildings. So shall be undertaken only by town meeting. Correct. So if it's a build, if it's a room within a building, this policy says it does not need to go to town meeting. No, I'm not talking about town meeting, David. I'm talking about if I wanted to name one of the conference rooms in the library trustees based on the second paragraph, it would have to come to the board of selectmen, and the board of selectmen would have to conduct a public hearing. Um, just for clarification, I should point out that. Probably the first couple paragraphs are straight from Concord, but the last paragraph is probably pieces from elsewhere. That's correct. So there may be some contradictions. Yeah. And that's fine. That I'm, I'm just talking about the second paragraph yeah. now. No, I agree. And actually, I kind of wonder about, you know, naming of rooms within a building. Does that really have to go to town meeting? I mean, no, I almost, no, I almost no, see that no, as a different level. It, it doesn't. The last paragraph would suggest it. So, so I'm, I'm fine with. So, so there's two aspects of this, right? What's the Board of Selectmen's involvement and what's town meeting's involvement? I think the explanation David provided on town meeting's involvement, you know, the bar that's set there, I think that's perfectly reasonable and I can accept it. Whether or not this is the, the exact wording, that, that's neither here nor there. The second paragraph gets into the fact, again, in the example that I provided, it's basically any name of public property buildings runs da, 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 da. the board or committee shall refer a suggestion or suggestions to the board of selectmen with a record of the hearing that the board of selectmen that shall make a decision so if the if the school committee or the, wanted to name a conference room if the library committee wanted to name a conference room they would conduct their hearing it would come to us and we'd have the ultimate say and so i'm just offering um in that example uh all the rooms that were named in the public library as a result of various donations and would have to would would have had to come to the board of selectmen and is is that what we're looking for yeah, or should I, I would say no i i think that that's i think that this is just my thoughts <coughs> the an elected board like the um school committee the school committee library trustees library i think they have jurisdiction over their individual kingdom uh, other than other if it crosses the last threshold it still needs to go to town meeting yes like for instance if they wanted to name the entire library 
to something. Brendan Jetwin Library. I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. <laughs> then it would need to go to town meeting. Yes. Okay. I'm, I think that's fine. I just don't want to have to have a lot I, of administrative. I understand your point. And if the school committee is responsible for the schools and the library is responsible for the library and we're responsible for everything else, that's kind of the way that I look at it. Yes. Sure. <clears throat> uh, hang on a second. Jason, any um, uh, the only broad thing, comments? Yeah, the only thing I would say, uh, I guess, just the, I guess, <clears throat> being broad, less so about the three years having been deceased. Um, I, I think I can probably understand the the intent behind that but uh, I don't necessarily think you should have to die to be recognized uh, oh well that's an interesting point yeah I mean do you name it after a living person you know, it's like the postal stamp problem you know yeah there, there are there are potentially some issues I mean my that, my but. my general inclination is deceased versus you know I just give a big hunk of money and buy myself a library name. Yeah, but town meeting would have to approve it. That's a good point. So good. yeah, I mean, if it does go to town meeting, and town meeting to wants that. to name it, then then I you know, you. so presumably, so and I guess the only other, again, I don't think you want to close the door to potential philanthropists. That, no, <laughs> no. I mean, no. it happens a lot in the schools. We're not talking Alan about. Point. We're not talking about you know, naming rights. We're talking about. You know dedications and memorials so i think you know that that to me is a separate thing and i guess if, if i may just a related one so again we've identified notionally in this conversation that there's three elected boards and then properties that they're no, notionally responsible for what if i'm you know joe smith and i want to name town hall after something should i have to go through the board of selectmen or should i go be able to go directly to town meeting well, one can always go to town meeting with a citizen petition, but not according to this policy. The preferred would probably. Well, I don't know why. I mean, citizen petition outranks everything, so that well, option's always open to everybody. It's. I mean, the but I don't want to get into. But lives. if if I don't know if the rec department wanted to name a gymnasium, they would have to come to us because. We property. control the property. Yeah, yeah. And then we would we'll probably just pass it on to town meeting. Vic, Vic, we know you have the question, so we'll get to you. We'll just get to you. Yeah, I guess I guess the only question is when we when we look to revise this, do we want to include? And I don't want to try to cover every contingency. I'm not looking to get that exact. It's more the intent. But again, if enough of the citizenry want to name it, regardless of what the individual board thinks, should that be explicitly called out in like the last paragraph, something about citizens' petitions? I don't know the wording. I'm just yeah, I mean, it would be intent. like this policy does not prohibit citizen petition yeah, right, initiated, citizen blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. Nothing in this policy. Something like okay. that. That's a good point. I mean, I, I just kind of always assume that. But. Uh, Okay, that's, um, I'm done. Before I kick it out to the public, and kick it over to uh, administration, Kevin, other than big pocket people. Yeah, I, I don't have those it. options open. Yeah, I have nothing more to add to it. Anybody have any thoughts on naming things after businesses versus people? <clears throat> oh, Citizens United told me that businesses are people anyway, so we're good. Ah, okay. Um, I don't know. I hadn't quite got that far. I, you know, I, I, you know, I can understand in Boston Fenway Park being named after a corporation or whatever. Uh, I don't think public property. I don't think, that's Bank, a little I don't think Bank of America wants to come and name you know yeah. Memorial Park Bank of America Memorial Park in Maynard. You know, so. But there um, may also be so again. Uh, I, I don't want to kill the Congress. Football field could be something that somebody wants to. Well. And, and now the now the policy is getting a little bit more complicated, right? And then do you differentiate for between for-profit and not-for-profit organizations, and what you're willing to allow things to get named by? I mean, I can I, I kind of like throw it all at town meeting. I can overcomplicate any policy. I mean, that's that's the easy. I got you. I got you. All right, um, Mr. Tommel, you have a question, comment? I would like to make some comments, if I may, since I uh, kind of the gentleman who kind of brought this whole thing up. You are the catalyst, yes. Uh, I find I 
find this proposal as written. It's not very well written, okay? Why would you dedicate a memorial to somebody and then have it removed in 20 years? I've never heard of such a thing. Oh, it's not, that's not what... Just a minute. No, go just ahead. Minute, Mr. Gavin, just a minute, okay? Uh, it looks to me like what we're doing is we're getting tied up with a lot of legislative malarkey here between the Board of Selectmen and this one and that one. If you remember, we recently opened a new library. There was a room at that library dedicated to a former chairman of the library trustees. That did not require a vote by this board or the town. The library trustees simply named the room after the former chairman because he did a good job. Now, I don't imagine that when that gentleman dies, that they're going to take the name off the room. I mean, that to me is an insult to say that you're going to memorialize somebody for 20 years, and at the end of 20 years, you're going to take the no, name. No, that's off. but that's not what the that's not what the proposal is. What it what it tries to do is to prevent exactly what you're suggesting. What it does is it says once something's named after someone. The town can't then three weeks later say, you know what, we want to name it now after, you know, per Citizen X. It has to stay with the shall, name. You're that's been saying in this that it shall not re be renamed. Shall not be renamed for at least transpired. for at least 20 that years. That means on 21 years. No, that's not what it means. Say, hey, it just means that, that it can't be. But it's not what it means. What it means is it can't be changed. I truly believe, yeah. Mr. Chairman, that this is just complicating things like you can't believe. No, I, I agree with you on the renaming. That always bothered me when I see people rename schools well, that's, and things that's like that. One, that's this is just one, one example of another town and the way they do it. And it's just out here for conversation. But but. That's only one part. You, you, you go up to the second paragraph and, and you turn it over to all these committees. And then after the selectmen received their recommendations and so forth, the Board of Selectmen, whether you gentlemen here present will be here at that time or not, have two months to decide. I mean, I know legislation is pretty slow because I sent a letter to the board back in last October about this. And here we are in August, and I, I have no idea what Mr. Gavin was doing, but I'll tell you, if, if you want me to get some information on this, I can get this information very quickly will be a hell of a lot clearer than what you've got written here, which I presume was written by town council. No, it was no, not. No, no, no. The, the, okay. the thing you're referencing is a direct copy from the town of Concord's policy. Well, and I don't quite understand why they have a timeline like that either. But well, anyway, I think it's to, quite frankly, I think it's to prevent, um, you know, somebody naming something and then three weeks later another. Uh, you know, there's a new board of appeals, or I'd say board of um, uh, recreation, that says, we don't like that name anymore, let's change it. No, the rule is it has to stay that name for at least 20 years. It doesn't mean it's going to be changed after 20 years. It just means that a name that's selected is stuck there for 20 years. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. That's the way to do it. Yeah. If you're going to name it, you've got to name it in perpetuity. Because what you're doing is you're... You're memorializing somebody, and that's not a memorial. I, I, I get that point. I quite okay. agree, yeah. I, I mean, the point. only caution is, you know, if it was named after well, after me, and then I, let it go then you figured out I was a bank robber, you might want to unname well, so, it. But. So I'm going to offer to you this. I, I think fixed point in regards to the 20 years is fine. I think you pull out the 20-year clause. Uh, I mean, we a lot of the other points that he made were addressed in our conversation. But in regards to the 20 years, just pull it out. And again, the extraordinary circumstances, the fact that if we name it after, uh, you know, someone who's living, like, hypothetically, Bill Crenshaw, and then he turns out to, to be a criminal, then, you know, you want to have the opportunity to change that under those extraordinary circumstances. Not suggesting yeah. anything, Bill. No, I like that. Yeah. If, if I could add, or actually, if I could ask a question, you know, we basically have made the point that you're going to town meeting because town meeting is the legislative body uh, whether it has a 20-year limit or it's in perpetuity if Bill Crenshaw robbed a bank and again sorry Bill uh, <laughs> you know if, if today we named it after you tomorrow you robbed the bank 
I would imagine you could still go back to town meeting. You can, but I get a name for me for six months till town meeting. Well, well until six meeting months, meeting. town meeting could simply say, "We don't we're like going that bank. to We're going to change the. We're going to change. Yep, we we put a rule in. We're going to change the rule, and then we're going to unname the yep. building after. I got you. I mean, it's really town meet with the policy of it being town meeting. Town meeting has the authority. I mean, again, beyond just rooms, but everything else, town meeting has the authority. I mean, you could put. You could. I mean, I, I just offer this that you, you kind of remove the 20-year language, mm -hmm. you include the, the extraordinary circumstances language, and ultimately town meeting decides. I mean, town meeting can decide in this, this scenario that we're describing that, you know what, it's not a big deal that Bill robbed a bank, that we'll just keep it. I mean, you, could, you can play out all these scenarios, but I'm not looking to overcomplicate the policy. You're just I, yep, muddying the water, fellas. That's all you're doing, you're muddying the water. Well, so um, in order to just move on, David, do you have enough direction to? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd be I'd be happy to hear if other, Vic has other th together. other things to suggest. I'd be happy to hear them. Can, um, for instance, did the town meeting vote for Ken Olson Plaza? Did the town meeting vote for Donald Lent Field? Can any of you answer that? I can, but I won't. Because I would think that you people are supposed to have some knowledge of what's going on. They're naming just because and buildings all over town. And just because and it may not have names on rooms just because in the old high school. I guess the point is, but may, just because they may have um, in the past not had a process doesn't mean that that is the best way to go about it. Most communities, especially historical communities, from what I gather, have policies that restrict how you name um, various public places. And it's not intended to be a, a convoluted process. It's meant to be a way that it's, it's, it's codified in a way that everybody knows what the process is. So that you don't have somebody saying, you know that part of land over there, I want to name that after Bill Cranshaw. And so what do you do to do that? What's the process? Oh, go to the Board of Selectmen. Oh, that sounds good tonight, yep. Then you suddenly have a pot of land named after Bill Cranshaw because the board felt good that evening. You have to have a process. May I suggest to you, Mr. S uh, Selectman, that having been a resident of the town of Acton, which is considered a pretty historic community around here, and Concord, I suggest maybe you should take the time and pick up the phone and call the people who do this, okay? And you'll find that what you're proposing here is not really the way they do it, okay? And at that point, I'm not going to belabor this thing anymore because I'm rather disappointed in the process you're outlining. I, okay. don't, th I don't think it should be that way. But that's my opinion. You're the town government here. You make the decisions. And I can disagree all I want, but I love you anyway. All right, so David, I'm, I'm hearing that we're not terribly excited with the way Concord does it. And, <laughs> and we, well, like, we like town meeting participation. So maybe you can put something yeah, we'll work together that reflects our comments for our just next meeting. A, just as a, we side, get a little closer side on this. comment, the city of Marlboro, city council, they do not memorialize anyone in the city of Marlboro anymore unless they've been in the service. Not necessarily that they have to be decorated, but having served their country in some capacity or another. Now, you can find out a lot of this information. It's very simple. You pick up the phone, you tell them who you are, and you tell them what you're looking for, and you would be amazed at how helpful many people who are employed by the surrounding towns treat you like a real human being and give you all the information you could possibly digest. Try it sometime. It works. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. So, David, we'll look forward to something for the next meeting. Um, item 13, discussion of reappointment of the town fire chief. This one's all yours, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Chief, uh, Chairman. Um, Mr. The, chief. the chief's uh, <laughs> contract, you have a copy of the uh, current contract in Dropbox. Um, it really just to uh, outline uh, more so the uh, the timing of the expiration of his existing contract 
um, which we're right now actually, I think today actually denotes the exact six month uh, time frame um, for the expiration of his existing contract. And uh, I've had some discussions with him. We're uh, anticipating moving into uh, collective bargaining negotiations uh, sometime probably late fall with the fire department and um, a couple of uh, reasons at premises. One, we want to give him notice um, of the board's uh, intention to uh, reappoint him. And then also we, the goal would be to try to work and work out a, uh, a new contract prior to uh, commencing the, the negotiations with the, with the fire department and get it off our plate. Um, so I'm asking, uh, Again, just a discussion of uh, that and seeking reappointment of the fire chief for a three-year term. So could I just ask a, a clarification point, if I may? Um, so yeah, I understand that it's six months out, and so you don't want to start at five weeks or five days before the expiration of the contract. That's perfectly reasonable. Um, so you need an indication from this board that we're looking to reappoint the chief, and then we could start discussing you know, within executive session contractual terms that we're looking to, to to advocate, if you will. But you need a clear indication from the board that we're looking to to reappoint this individual prior to obviously entering into contractual negotiations. Is that fair? That's fair. That's in the, the motion language again, contingent upon contract agreement, and also furthermore to. Uh, authorize the town administrator to negotiate a successor contract with final approval from the Board of Selectmen. And it would be, again, just another clarification point, the the term would be from uh, the, the the next three-year term is February um, 6, 2015. Uh, let's try to see if I can read. 15. February 6, 2015 to February go with 18. 5, 2018. Correct. So my brain wasn't working. Okay. Um, is that it, Brennan? Yeah, no, I think that's all the things I was trying to clarify. Uh, you mentioned that it's interesting that I know in your contract we have a clause that requires us to give advance notice of intent. This one doesn't, and I don't ask it in any way to suggest that I do not support uh, uh, renewing the contract, because I do. Um, I ask it in the, the spirit of wondering if it's something that should be added. I wouldn't have signed it with, without it. I mean, I think it's uh, it's only, um, you know, I, I think in a professional position of that, six months is, uh, you know, a minimum. Yeah. Uh, that should be. Uh, well, whatever the, whatever the so time may be is negotiable, but. Yeah, I don't think it specifies, but certainly he has, um, le you know, uh, legitimate concerns if uh, if the board, for whatever reason, um, was not looking to move forward with a uh, reappointment and you know six month time frame is uh, you know, certainly a minimum needed to and, and I would offer that it, if someone we move forward uh, I would expect a very similar term in the future chief you know in the future contract as Kevin has in his I mean I think for any professional position of which this certainly is that's just a standard item or should be a standard item now Kevin without talking details could you mention the topics that you think in the contract might be modified? Uh, likely, I, there's some, looking at um, some of the vacation allotment, putting that in line with uh, some of our other contracts, uh, with employment contracts with paid time off, and um, in line more in line with uh, the existing police chief's contract, likely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the only other Real sticking point is, uh, you know, it would be obviously uh, salary. I think the most part, the preliminary look at it, there's not a whole lot of changes that are necessary. Okay, and and uh, I have one more question, but I'm gonna kick it over to Jason for the time. You got any comments about this? Um, no, not really. I, you know, one question would be for Kevin. So how, in your opinion, as a town administrator, how is, how is the fire chief doing? Yeah, absolutely, that's a fair question. Um, I think he's done a, a, a great job um, leading the department and uh, has really um, you know, moved the department into uh, current times, if you will, uh, with initiatives and technology and his trainings um, have been 
uh, amazing turnaround in three years that he's taken on. Um, the amount of trainings that the department is doing uh, has just exceeded everyone's hopes without real, um, you know, he, he's looked at sort of out thinking outside the box uh, alternatives to training that hasn't had a massive impact to the budget with the amount of trainings that you see that he's doing. Um, and uh, he's done a good job leading the department. Um, and uh, he's always, uh, always wanted to come with, uh, you know, with, with suggestions and, and uh, solutions. So I would recommend it. Okay. I, and I appreciate that because, uh, you know, I, based on what limited time I've been here, you know, I've seen that the, the chief has put together several plan documents, including a planning document for the department. Mm -hmm. Um, which he did in, I believe, his first, like his first six months here, that document okay. was created, as well as to a capital, a capital yes, project. Yeah, capital so he's, I think, and I'm sorry to rain on your no, parade, that's, that's I, I, I think the Chiefs brought a, uh, a, a new era of professionalism and, and investment on behalf of the department. Like they're invested in, in themselves as a result of the leadership that he's shown. Um, yeah, I, I concur. My, my uh, biggest observation, because obviously we don't get involved in the day-to-day -day operation. What they do professionally is beyond where I am. But I see it um, in the attitude of his uh, firefighters and the way that they interact with uh, me as a selectman, me as an individual member of the community, um, and just I think the pride that I think has taken over and I say that about the fire department because we're talking about it, but I think the same thing has happened in many ways with the police department. So um, certainly I'm strongly in favor of, of renewing the contract and would direct the, uh, would support directing the town administrator to, uh, to proceed to negotiate a contract that is acceptable to us all. All right. Um, Beck, I'm gonna shut you out of this one. Um, this is a contract discussion, not a uh, Q and A opportunity. Look, I'd like to ask a question for no. clarification, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm not taking the question. It's not, not appropriate. Not taking the question. No. Um, I'm going to make a motion to appoint Chief I think, Anthony. I think you should take a question, Mr. Chairman, because it's, as I understand it, you've so, been so noted for three Vic. years, and when you when you renew the contract, the, the second contract, supposedly you cannot discharge that person except for cause. Vic, there are some things we allow Q&A from the audience on and some things we don't. This is not one of them. I'm not criticizing the gentleman's labors. I'm not criticizing what he's doing. I'm asking a question for clarification. When you give him the second contract, if you have a does question, that mean if you that you question? don't have to renew it at the end of the term? If you have a question on this issue, take it up at the town administrator's office outside of this meeting. But on these types of agenda items, we do Whatever not you take Q&A. All right, I make a motion you to appoint can't answer the question. Chief That's Anthony Stowers for a three-year term effective February 6, 2015, contingent upon contract agreement, and furthermore, to authorize the town administrator to negotiate a successor contract with the fire chief for board of selectmen approval. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Um, I'll second it, but I have some discussion. All right. We have a motion and a second. Um, we have discussion? Yeah, I guess my discussion was, um, since you said a three-year term commencing on February 6th, I guess we can all do the math. Um, but the other thing was, um, are we looking, I know it's a position that we appoint, and that's the motion on the table. Uh, I may offer that um, an alternative to your motion is to invest the, the town administrator with the authority to actually approve the contract. Now, again, we have six months, but um, he's could certainly negotiate it. I mean, if, if you feel it needs to come back to the board for final approval, I don't know. I'm offering that perhaps it doesn't, but consider it a discussion. Point. Well, we, you would agree that we need to agree on the terms, correct? Um, Yes, I think we need to agree on the terms. I suppose that's true. Um, and we would, you know, at, at another meeting, we'd go into executive session and say we'd, you know, like to do this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, I guess since we approve collective bargaining agreements, I don't know. I, I mean, um, 
I, I would be a little uncomfortable in, in uh, if it, since it's our appointment and it's our final approval, um, before knowing what the contract says, authorizing the contract to be signed it seems to be. I would also point out that the wording of the motion comes from the town administrator. Okay. Not, well, it's well, not well mine. thank you for pointing that out. I'm just, I would, I would. It's fine. I, I made my point. There's a motion on All the right. table. Do we have so, any further discussion? Well, that, that's so we understand the, can you read the motion again? And I, I, I don't want to vote against it and then make it appear that we're not in favor of appointing the chief again, because that's not the point. Yep. What, I, what I intended or would like us to do is to authorize, basically send the message to the chief that we do intend to renew the contract pending the agreement between the town administrator and the chief. That's it, basically. But there's still more discussion to come, but he can rest assured it's our intention that we're going to do our best to come to a new contract agreement. Is that what, what the motion, motion says? says? All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the motion, and then we'll go to Kevin for confirmation on that interpretation. But uh, <laughs> the motion is uh, appoint Chief Anthony Stowers for a three-year term effective February 6, 2015, contingent upon contract agreement, and furthermore to authorize the town administrator to negotiate a successor contract with the fire chief for board of selectmen approval. Yeah, so is, uh, that is, sounds to be, okay? yeah. Yes, exactly. All right, so I think we're all on the same page. Uh, just for clarification further, and I'm sorry to del belabor, but um, if, there are con if there are issues like salary, you'll be coming to us to get that Absolutely. direction. Yeah, okay. Well, because we have to approve the final contract per the True, motion the and that's why, I, yeah. Turn your mic off. Okay, if there's no further discussion, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion passes 4-0. <coughs> All right. Uh, topic number 14 is Community Preservation Committee proposal ideas. And I believe in our packet we have a timeline from them about, uh, let's see, in order to get everything done for the May 2015 town meeting, the preliminary applications are due September 26 and uh, that starts the thing so tonight we're asking the board members for uh, general thoughts on um, proposals we might want to initiate if any and uh, then uh, at a following meeting we can narrow it down to one or maybe two but uh, Jason I'll start with you for uh, uh, any uh, thoughts you have on an application that the board might want to be a sponsor of? Uh, not at this moment. Okay. Brendan? Um, unfortunately, I'm coming up a little bit empty right now. Too. I, I got a few, so I just like that. Kind of stuff. All right, I'm going to go with uh, David then. Um, yeah. And... I think it's a, it's, a, it's a larger conversation in, at the end of the day, and we're not going to get there tonight for sure, and we're not going to get there probably by the deadline of CPC, but I think there needs to be a discussion on whether or not the Coolidge School is something that we want to invest in as a community, um, utilizing those funds, and whether or not we utilize it as a school administration building or some other function. Uh, there's been strong sentiment from the uh, from the uh, the historic commission to uh, ask us and to push for us to make sure that that building does not get demolished or destroyed in 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 a, in a fashion. Apparently, it's a historic building that's noted on the historic board of registers or whatever it is, and um, so it's something we have to think about. And but. The reason I say it's a longer conversation is because it invo obviously involves the schools. We need to have their understanding of what their plan is, and we have to know if uh, if they have no interest in using that building, then what is the, what is the functionality of that building going forward for the town? So I think the Coolidge School has to be part of the conversation. Yeah, and I I, I concur that um, you know I would hate to waste the opportunity of this funding source um, uh, 
uh, if we wait too long on that discussion. So, I think, Mr. Chair, just to um, elaborate on that, I mean, the, the current condition of the building, um, I, my understanding is they're planning on being out of there before um, the heating season. Um, school administration is looking to relocate to the Fowler School, um, at which time the, the building will be turned back to the town and determination made on what to do with it. Also understanding from um, the condition of the building, it's unlikely that um, they'll allow occupancy of the building once they've vacated. Um, and preliminary prior estimates uh, of several million dollars for restoration. Seven? Several. Oh. Um, I don't recall the exact figure. Two. At least, and that was at least two. That, and that was, was years, years ago. ago. I mean, they're looking at probably in the neighborhood of four million dollars. So it certainly isn't a CPC application discussion um, to so, make it a viable building. As far as the historical thing, I think there's still some debate on that. Just you know, as far as I don't know that it's actually recorded as historical versus it's old. And there was, <laughs> there was a architect that um, had done this building and another building, um, but I don't, it's not a building that, I, I believe it's not a building that's. Well, it, it sounds like this topic is, is being attended to and overlaps with, you know, upcoming and, and future capital um, budget discussions. So I, 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 we're good about talking it right now. I mean, I'm more concerned about things that if we don't keep talking about them, we'll forget about them until it's too late. Sure. And I think the coolest school in the next few weeks, we're going to keep talking about it. Yeah. So it's good that we brought it up. But for the moment, I don't know that we have to have any further discussion on that particular item. So if I may, Bill, I, um, I, I'm, I'm not looking to, to, to further discussion as far as substantively on what we should or should not do with the Coolidge School. However, um, I don't know. I forget how many months ago the Historical Commission reached out to us. Mm -hmm. But it seems like, given that the school administration is soon to vacate it, um, we as the selectmen should really identify a process of uh, how do we even go about deciding what to do with it. Um, you know, I know there was a committee, gosh, how many years ago that looked at it. Um, it was a while ago. Um, my guess is, is that as soon as the school administration gets out of there, the school committee is going to issue a move to, to Give it to us. I forget the exact words, but to, that it's no longer it's you know no longer used by the school, so it'll come under our bailiwick, and we'll have to um, figure out what to do with it. And, and again, I'm not saying we should do one thing or another. I'm, what I'm offering is that we need to figure out a process to to, to involve the community, um, you know, to figure out because you know four million dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> yep. No, I agree. I'm I'm just saying that for the topic of. Um Community Preservation Committee application. It's not. It's, it's not it's a not really, But I think I think it's pretty much an agenda item next meeting. <laughs> or several meetings. Yes. All right. Very good. Uh, so budgets. back to Community yeah. Preservation Committee proposal ideas, uh, David. Um, right. Well, that was the one that would, that was that, that the four for me. Okay. Uh, although you know there is there is an, an active group. Um, it won't not, doesn't necessarily have to be supported by the Board of Selectmen, uh, you know, and, and I know that that's what we're looking for, are things that are sponsored by the Board of Selectmen. But I know there's a group looking at alumni field issues. I know there's a group looking at, um, you know, all aspects of alumni field um, and looking at whether or not um, CPC money can help with projects over there. And I, I think given the use of the track and the use of that facility, that in many ways it's important for the town and maybe it's not a this year item but it might be something that has to go on to discussion for next year for um, for real detailed discussion and education of, of the town as to the value of perhaps doing something over there and I think we can I think it's recreational I think it's also historic in some fashion that we could utilize uh, the funding source and get something done to answer some of the problems that exist at that facility. All right, very good. So, uh, Kevin and Andrew, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah, we've Any been thoughts? discussing some smaller projects, um, looking at potentially uh, seeking some funds for uh, from the historical side on a uh, town hall display case. Um, 
potentially for displaying, trying to clean up that lobby, make it more presentable. And uh, if you, if you had an up, well, you, everybody's been in the police station. If you've seen kind of their historical display case of former um, badges and some kind of memorabilia. But one, one thing that comes to mind as we start talking about some of this stuff internally is uh, the recently um, uncovering of the uh, time capsule that was uh, put in the vault and uh, is due to be open, I think, in seven years? 2020. 2020. Yeah, so about six years. Um, things like that and some historical uh, items um, it, you know, I, I think would be really serve well in town hall, which right now in the um, lobby we're trying to clean up and get away from kind of just a table with loose papers and really uh, make it presentable. So something like that comes to mind. Um, and then uh, That's po interesting. potentially um, some uh, memorial park enhancements. Uh, it's kind of come to light. Um, potentially, whether that be through like an acquisition of a, uh, a nice gazebo um, that could be really at the forefront of the corner of that property, utilize uh, you know for residents to enjoy and during community events. Um, and in line with that, uh, if not that and or that, something along the line of uh, potential expansion or use of the for the community band group, uh, stand if we were to go that direction. But um, a lot of people are just kind of throwing it around. Hey, what do you think of a, a gazebo there? Um, you know, something like a nicer sitting type of thing. And it's gotten some good feedback. Uh, just a, another thought, but more um, more assets to the actual park itself, kind of draw the, the use there. And uh, I think once we, you know, with the a little bit of the expansion and cleaning up and leveling it off and some landscaping, I think it'd be, it's going to be a really uh, one. It's extremely visible, but uh, Hopefully, it'll be something that's that's used, um, and then it, other projects that are specific that come to mind are the uh, the rail trail project. We're probably going to have to seek some additional funding um, from community preservation for the uh, rail trail easements. We're at the point now where, um, it, as you know, it's been bumped up on the 2015 uh, tip for the. Uh, but there's going to be some costs likely. I don't know what the exact costs beyond what we already have for that available legal costs. costs, or is it? It's a lot of it's through for land acquisitions, and there is some final um, engineering costs that we're still trying to get better numbers with the town of Acton on from uh, GPI, who's the engineering firm that's doing uh, the 75 percent design, um, you know, the design completion project, uh, the, the remainder of it. Um, that the town share has with the town of Acton, um, so we're we're doing it. We're, we're looking at that now—a better accounting of um, potential funds. But I, I'm almost guaranteed there's going to be some sort of uh, shortage of funds. But most of it's probably going to be towards the uh, the easement acquisitions um, for some for the property related to the trail. And then, you know, certainly a bigger discussion would be um, potential housing acquisitions that might be. A um, property that might be available that's that's currently blighted or closed up that we could you know acquire um, whether it be through an affordable housing component or just as a tear down open space use um, property on River Street and the corner of uh, Parker Waltham come to mind at, at the uh, Snyder Snyder Murphy Snyder uh, print place um, Granted, those are some bigger discussions, but also want to be thinking about them because we don't want to miss any opportunity um, that could come across that we could come across for an acquisition like that. Well, uh, related to that topic, if you have anything was else, one of mine on the opportunity for ac acquiring open space, and you know, it's one to say, oh, here's a specific project, and it's another to say, let's have a little fun that so we can act right. in time. Yeah, you know, if if you know, if we wanted to go by the church, which is for sale, and, right. you know, it would take us nine months to get our act together versus having the money and, you know, it's a lot easier to go to town meeting and exactly. say, hey, the money's right here. Yep. Can we spend it versus, oh, can we get the yeah, money? So, an, and so you would propose that to be an annual allocation? Well, I, so. I don't know. I always looked for, I don't know, a quick action. I agree. A quick action land acquisition funding option somehow. Can, is that legal under the um, the terms of CPC to develop a, a sort of a bank account of quick access accessible? 
they have to put 10% yeah. of the annual funding into open space acquisition? No, but historical or yeah, I, I know the committee kicked the idea before. I mean, the board. A previous board submitted it to a previous committee, and they, yeah, they rejected it. So yeah, I don't. I don't actually know on the grounds of what. But. I think they said it was illegal, but, and yeah. that was part of the frustration that we had was that other towns were doing this, and we were saying, well, why isn't our people doing? It? Or why aren't our people doing it? Because uh, uh, that raised an issue for me too. Another one of the proposals we've had in the past, which I really think we could utilize, is, um, and other communities have done it. We have some sidewalk issues that could be addressed if the sidewalks lead to recreation facilities. Oh, and, nice. and Acton has used that um, opportunity because you, you know, so you, ha you find sidewalks that need repair or sidewalks that are, um, just don't exist that can lead people to recreation locations. I believe it meets the qualifications, at least it's gotten passed in other communities. Um, and we might have situations like that that uh, we can benefit from, but is it, I don't know if it's too late in the game to find those locations or whatever and to identify them and to do the research that's necessary. But. Well, those are interesting ideas. Um, could I add one popped into my head. Do you mind if I just quickly jump in? Or? Yeah, I was gonna let Andrew. Have a shot, but you He's first. He's got a tie on it. No, no, no. first. Kevin's already read the list. Yeah. Okay, all right, very so, good. So one that pops into mind is the skateboard park by Green Meadow. <laughs> um, yes. Is that on your list? Uh, it is not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I, I feel good then. Uh, so it, it serves a This is deja vu. Uh, I know. We, did, we talked about this, like, my first year on the board. So um, in any case, it... I would offer that it serves a recreational use as it provides parking. It provides parking for school functions, but it also provides parking for, um, you know, baseball. Ball, ball function, like people play in Crow Park. So if we could invest a small amount of money, I don't think it's really a big amount of money, but a small amount of money, rip down the fence, you know, restripe it. I know there's a level diff uh, gradient difference, you know. I can't imagine it being a lot of money to make that an accessible parking lot and actually um, increase the safety of traffic flow within that that existing Green Meadow Crow Park parking lot. So I might put that on my list. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there is the issue of its designated parkland, and you know, legislative action I don't, might, might be required. But I don't maybe think, not. I don't maybe think not. the parking lot is designated parkland. Uh, the skateboard is. Skateboard park is. Uh, it depends on that how piece we, of it. It depends on how we did it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Um, my thoughts actually have been touched on by most every people. Uh, exception is I'm reminded by the emblem back here that uh, Maynard's 150th is in 2021, and maybe there's a way to start banking some money. <laughs> so we, we have talking. it there at the time. We started talking about that internally as well. And I believe when the Historic Commission was last here uh, in front of the Board of Selectmen, they mentioned that um, they had already started their process of planning for that event in uh, 2021. Yeah, and my point is simply. But you want to have some money so we can money. have some fireworks <laughs> or something. Something, I don't know, but something, that's just the thought. All right, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not looking for action tonight, but those are interesting discussion points, and I mean, we'll just, we can mull them over and uh, we can bring it back up at a. Uh, a near future meeting and maybe there's a couple of good ones that uh, we'll want to focus on cool uh, agenda item 15 oh water and sewer abatement policies oh, this introduction is mine this is this is stuff left over from earlier discussions many months ago when we had a spate of uh, abatement requests. And is this in Dropbox or is this just in this the packet? This is in, in the, the packet. 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 Actually, I think you did put it in Dropbox. It's in Dropbox. Oh, yeah, it is in Dropbox separately, but you're right. It's also in the packet as, like, the last few pages. I'm looking for Dropbox. Uh, uh, Dropbox, it would be... 
I don't see it. But that, that's okay. I'll go through the. Huh. I'll go it through was the, in Dropbox. It was in there. I'll go through the packet. I might have maybe somebody accidentally deleted it, but it's in the packet. It's the last page yep. of the packet. Yep. And it's a couple points that, uh, you know, during our discussions of various abatements, we said, oh yeah, we should think about that and do something about that. And so uh, I bring forth to the board uh, some suggestions, and the uh, first of which is. Um, the policy on adjustments for prior use of water and sewer. And, you know, it applies both to clawback provisions by the town of, oops, you know, we forgot to bill you correctly, so we're gonna charge you for 25 years of past use, or, you know, how, how long a period can somebody ask for an abatement? And uh, just for uh, generating discussion here, and, you know, we're not looking for action tonight, but we're just generating discussion on the uh, policy of adjustments for prior use of water and sewer. The suggestion is for a uh, two-year period, a 24-month period, um, that being a compromise for the rate uh, payer who, you know, takes a little while to notice um, things wrong with it, the bills because some of the differences are only seasonal. And it also sets a limit on clawbacks by the town for uh, improper billing. It does not, in this case, the time limit would not apply for, uh, you know, clawbacks that weren't uh, related to town inaction. I mean, if somebody had an illegal connection that uh, nobody knew about, there would be no time limit on that clawback. But uh, I just, uh, present uh, that topic for uh, board discussion. And do uh, we have any comments on that? Any thoughts? Do we remember when we had our discussion uh, with the gentleman who was in here three or four months ago, did we use 24 months for him or did we use three years? Or We used three years. Three years. On that, on Is that there a reason sure. why you're proposing to go to two years? Um, mostly just because it's about the time, the worst case, scenario for trying to figure out there was something wrong with your bill thinking from the user standpoint mm -hmm. but uh, you know I don't doesn't really matter to me that much just trying to pick some date because I know that 20 years is too long yes <laughs> and three months is too short and it's somewhere in the middle you definitely need to have at least <laughs> at least one cycle of bills and uh, two cycles of bills make sense I'm just wondering if Three years might be better, but mm -hmm. I'm not. It's just a point. All right. Uh, um, Brendan, you got comments? Yeah. It's a, so uh, two years seems fine. I guess I don't have a strong opinion uh, on whether it should be plus or minus 12 months there. Um, on the abatements, um, so the sewer I don't think is, is an issue. Um, well, we're only talking about the um, the uh, adjustment policy, the 24 month thing. We're not we're not yet talking about the uh, oh leaks and floods. Leaks. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. Then I'm done. Trying to simplify the discussion. Um, Jason, any thoughts on the uh, water and sewer abatements? You haven't gone through any, but maybe you've witnessed some. Oh, I sat through your last one. And uh, so, you know, thoughts on uh, you know what some fair compromise is between. Uh, the town gets more money or the ratepayer pays less money? Um, I would say let's strictly sticking with the uh, adjustments and the clawbacks. Um, I, I see the intent on the 24 month. Um, you know, I think that's reasonable. I, I can only look back at myself and say that if I get a water bill that's significantly higher than the last one, I look at the last three or four, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, are shown on the bill. Uh, usage, yeah. usage is the last. I think the bills are too, aren't they? Three. I, I mean, the, the bills the change. Amount is not. Bills change once in a while, but yes, usage is shown okay. for a year. Are you sure about that? I well, lately, the uh, problem is the bills get reformatted. Yeah, things every change every years, now and so, then. You know, uh, that's really not my my can't point. Be guarantee to that. My point being is that three software conversions. If I if I think the number is even slightly off, 
I, I'm looking at it and getting ready to like pick up the phone. So <laughs> to call yourself. <laughs> to, to call. Out. That was before. N- now I don't call at all. Uh, <laughs> that's my donation to the town. Uh, you know, I think that's reasonable. Um, I have some issue on. You know, I, I understand the need to be fair on both directions here. I have some issue on the town going back. Uh, especially if it's if it's somehow documented that the town can go back beyond 24 months um, uh, again I'm not sure I don't have an answer for that at this point but you know that would be one where if, if there was a known a known issue and that you could then go from there and say well if it was known why wasn't it fixed but if there was for some reason some sort of a known billing issue that was picked up beyond 24 months you know, we would effectively have shorted ourselves that. Yes, and I recognize that. I mean, two thoughts on that. One is I like rules that apply both to the town and to the people. That's fair. I hate differences between the two. <laughs> and um, going back to my experience doing um, income taxes, the IRS policy is basically they got three years to fix it, and you got three years to fix it. And that's it, unless of course you were a drug dealer or something. But so I like, I understand the you know the potential loss of revenue to the town, but I just like what's fair for the town should be fair for the ratepayer. Any thoughts from uh, Kevin or Andrew? I don't have any. I have not um, seeked any input from. Uh, DPW on this, but all right. I don't think they've they've had time to review it and provide any comment. Okay, so let's move on to the um, the other topic. Um, during our uh, flood of abatements, pun intended, um, we had a lot of issues with people having some sort of catastrophic leak, and. Uh, to me, it came down to, you know, do we really want to pile on as a town to, you know, the problems being experienced by others? I mean, they're already laying out lots of cash to fix leaks and things like that, or they suffered water damage. Do we really want to profit from their, uh, their trouble? And so this particular one is uh, the suggestion which we've been consistent on in our abatements is we don't charge sewer fees for, you know, big leaks because it doesn't actually end up in the sewer. Uh, The difference here is that the suggestion that we charge a lower rate for the excess water use, um, a rate that's sufficient for the town to recoup its costs, but not for the town to profit from that wasted water. Um, so the town would stay cost neutral and the person would still pay some extra money in addition to all their other costs, but uh, we try not to uh, make things that much worse for our uh, rate payers. When we discussed this before, Bill, I, I thought, I remember you making the suggestion about how the excess water usage, it's a little bit unfair to charge them at the, the higher step ratings. Yep. Um, so I, I agree with the sentiment of the initial step rating. Um, I just don't remember the, the, the thought in regards to one half. I think so. Again, we're looking to review the policy and do what makes sense and is what is fair and for, for all parties. Um, so I'm not going to totally rely on past precedents, but past precedents, precedents was you don't get charged for sewer, you get charged for water at the water rates. Now, an alternative to what you're suggesting is you know the excess water is just at the the first step rate versus the higher step rates and not one take out the one half but i'd like to understand right. your basis of the one half like why is that fair or well, not fair yeah i mean two points one is the step rates are really conservation rates so you know we're not really trying to conserve by penalizing at high rates so that's why we're talking about the initial step rate the uh, number for the one half is um comes from the uh the general acceptance that uh, half of water charges are related to fixed capital costs and half are related to marginal extra costs for delivering the product and that's where it comes from but um, 
you know, it's just out there for discussion. So, but uh, that's where it comes from. So, so that that's reasonable. So, in the case of excess usage, um, you know, in, in the uh, you know the scope of this discussion, the water was delivered, right? So, so is the one half they're paying the delivery cost or the capital cost in your mind? The delivery cost. Okay. The cost for pumping and treating the the you know day to day operating cost, not the not the amortization of the pipes, but the energy and the the treatment and the labor and all that. So I think I appreciate the the sentiment. I, I'm not sure that. The, the explanation I fully digest because because you could say that the water flowed so it was pumped and the, the pipes corroded let's not talk about corroded pipes but you know yeah, right. you know so the the quality of it from the <laughs> this is not going to be the best way to explain from the pipes perspective it doesn't matter it was <laughs> excess water right and I'm not trying to be unfair to the to, to the t the uh, ratepayer I'm really not but again the infrastructure the water was pumped the infrastructure was burdened Yep. No, so, that, that's fair. And I think the big difference is, you know, it's not whether you're doing one half of the initial step. It's whether you're charging the initial step rate or the super high punitive um, conservation based step rate. No, I'm totally fine with the initial step rate mm -hmm. because of, of what you've provided as an explanation. Gotcha. It's the one half that I'm mm -hmm. mulling over. Uh, Jason, <coughs> you got thoughts? Uh, sure. Lots of them. Excellent. Uh, it's water. It's my favorite. Um, I guess I appreciate the explanation on the, uh, and I I can understand the looking at the additional, uh, we'll call it spillage, for uh, the lowest step rate. Uh, again, obviously conservation and huge leaks don't go hand in hand. Um, I I guess in relation to the sewer. Um, you know, it, it, I would say there would be there would need to be some confirmation that leaked flow did not enter the sewer system. Hmm. Good point. Um, so obviously, if there's a broken hose in a basement on a washing machine, and it goes into the floor drain or into the slop sink, then I would say they are still uh, should still be held responsible for that. Um, and again, that could be as simple as there is no drain, there is no plumbing in the area where this broke, therefore they're not, they wouldn't be uh, obliged to that cost. Uh, I guess to, to your point about the, I guess I'm gonna go with the, the half, regardless of what the, the difference in cost between the fixed cost of the infrastructure, and I'm gonna even narrow that down to um, physical buildings, the wells themselves. Uh, you know, yeah, we we do make. You know, if if 100% of our costs are split 50-50, 50% for our say debt service and fixed cost, and 50% are the power for the pumps and the chemicals. That doesn't. The town doesn't make a profit until we meet our until we hit our minimum amount of flow generated for the year. So, uh. you know, so if we were to if we were to underrun the amount of gallons of water we sold for the year, and we allow this abatement, sort of as it was described, the town loses money for the year. Uh, and I'm not trying to make this a conversation like that. I'm just pointing it out that, you know, last year I think you you didn't have to raise the rates because we case. sold more water than we did the previous than we had expected. So the rates were set to a certain number of gallons and we oversold that. So in that case, yes, the town does make some money. Um, but the same applies the opposite direction. Uh, well, that's good. I appreciate the uh, understanding that we're in the business of selling water. We are in the business. The profit comes from the extra water we sell. The extra water we sell keeps us going. And, and I do have to point out that the one half, that, that ratio of 50-50 capital to operating is just a generic rule of thumb no, that's statewide. Fine. I'm just I have no idea what the number <laughs> is for Maynard. No, and I don't know, you know, I'm sure somebody here probably in DPW or one of the guys for the plants know 
what that number is. But so, Jason, would you be okay if the second um, category, for lack of a better word, just said the excess water flow will be billed at the initial step rate? No, I think that would be reasonable. Um, again, I, I appreciate Bill's sentiment of the, the, the object here is not to pile on to somebody who just had a washing machine hose break. Right. I, at the same side, the, the flip side of that is, uh, you know, you're responsible for your own plumbing and you're responsible to make sure your heat is turned on. And, you know, unless there's some other you know catastrophic event that all of these things sort of fall apart but if the if the line in the street breaks that's on the town if the line before your meter breaks that's on the town so really the the, the piece that affects the abatement is, is i don't mean to belittle it it's a small piece compared to everything else and i think recently the most the three most recent abatements were i believe a broken washing machine hose uh, uh, a failure to make sure the oil was topped off over the winter and uh, i think the third one if i recall was an inappropriate in a, in a, in a, uh, a not proper irrigation meter installation so they were the three i think most recent abatements that the board has seen and correct me if i'm wrong i think we saw actually i think there are actually two of the frozen pipe type deals in addition to the other two that you commented on. And we had a couple of foundation pipe breaks that you don't yeah, that see until it starts bubbling out of the ground. They went into, they and all went into the wall, into, the, into the yard. Yeah, <laughs> right. you're right. But again, that's, if that's after the, if that's before the meter, there isn't a charge for that to the homeowner. Yes, but it was after. But it was, it went through the, it went through the house basically, and then was exiting the house and just never made it to the sewer. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, then yeah, that uh, would. Yeah. I mean, those are my preliminary thoughts. I, I mean, I would be, I would not have an issue if, um, you know, if we receive something from DPW or the billing that put together a number that may be appropriate. I just think it should be, it should be clear how that number is calculated if it's anything other than at least the minimum step. Yep, understood. Any further comments, David? No. Kevin, any thoughts? Uh, no, just, uh, again, just echoing uh, Selectman Creel's um, comment on, you know, some, as every year as we revisit this with uh, Toby Fetter and, you know, he obviously always cautions us that the somewhat more restrictive use of water is going to end up costing the rate payers more and again to some degree we are in the business of selling water so keeping that i think it's a great point mm -hmm. okay very good thank you for that um next topic up we have capital planning presentation from andrew is that correct correct and i see from our drop box that we have presentation and a big spreadsheet stuff I would um, suggest to the board members that since this information just came in right before the meeting that we stick with the presentation discussion the big picture and the details I wonder if maybe we want to do that you know in concert with FinCom so if we have a hundred questions Andrew only gets asked them once instead of at two separate meetings well, uh, this presentation was intended to be very high level. Um, at the last Selectman's meeting, you asked that the draft detail be provided. It was provided to the Dropbox that night. Uh, I received some feedback from the board on that draft. That was version three, if you saved it to your computers. Um, version four was added to the Dropbox today. Um, I don't expect you to have reviewed it. It's not a dramatically different change. Um, in terms of the level of detail, there's there's a lot more information in there, but it's the same spreadsheet uh, in its bones. The presentation, though, is the PowerPoint document. It's up on the screens if you don't have it on your uh, iPads. And it's just a few slides I'm going to take you through. It's the concept of how um, people in the town, uh, people in the town administration feel 
we should be moving forward to uh, better manage our capital planning. So um, our current situation in Maynard is that 14% of our, next slide please, Zach, 14% um, of our budget is spent on debt. And another perhaps 3%, it fluctuates each year, um, is cash spent on capital purchasing. Roughly 17% of our budget on those items is highly unsustainable. A typical healthy financial community will spend between 4 and 8% of their budget on debt or capital financing of, of purchasing. And the town doesn't really have a good, coherent 5 or 10 year plan for capital. Uh, we've seen this come up in the past year. It's part of why the board asked that we at the town administration try to address it with this through this process. So the plan that we have come up with is to take the to get the FinCom, get the Board of Selectmen to agree to a target uh, debt and capital spending ratio. Um, I suggested that four to eight percent is the norm. I can provide you with a lot of background detail on that from ICMA and other organizations as well as neighboring communities and so on. It fluctuates. There's no particularly right number. Um, but it's in that range typically. You'll see it spike when a community builds a school, for instance. It's part of the reason ours is so high right now, because we did just build a school. But even with that, uh, a typical community would have it closer to, say, 12%. So if the town commits to that, let's say we're going to pick the number 6%. I'm suggesting that because the rest of the information is based on that. Um, and then how do we get there? It'll probably take us approximately 10 years. You'll see that in a moment. Um, but one way that we're going to get there is we're going to start moving the non-excluded retiring debt into a budget. So what that means is that um, much of our debt is excluded, which means it falls off the tax rolls entirely, helping to lower the tax rate in town. But the non-excluded debt can remain in the tax base. Right now it gets distributed. We take our non-excluded money and we share it amongst all the other departments in town. When we take it and we keep it in a fund and say this, this budget is for capital, sometimes that's cash, sometimes that's debt, but it doesn't get redistributed to other departments in town after it retires off the debt roll. It stays in as cash. It's then used for cash capital. It's a pretty straightforward process. It's kind of hard to explain, but uh, you'll see it on the spreadsheets as we retire, say, $100,000 in debt. It just becomes part of a cash budget. I'm also suggesting, or the committee working on this is suggesting that the town begin budgeting for more cash capital. They actually set aside money each year. Uh, larger and larger numbers will be required over time, but uh, we could start off modestly with, say, $100,000 or $200,000. With that type of a plan, we can get to our targets within 10 years. The next two charts are going to show you some of that. The first one shows you what our annual budget looks like today, $40 million, and what it would look like uh, in 2020 with 3.25% growth. That's a little bit conservative for normal growth uh, for municipalities, typically trends uh, closer to 4% over the long term. Uh, but you know, we're offsetting, we're only getting about 70% of our money from property taxes, so assuming some cutbacks in state aid, that, that conservative growth pattern is probably realistic for our growth. What you see in the bottom chart, the bar chart, are the target and the actual debt payments we're making. The red is what we're actually making, and the gray or the blue would be the target based on the 6% of the budget. So as the budget increases modestly, you see the gray bar go up slightly. Over time, though, we are paying off our debt. In the next five years, it doesn't look like we made a lot of progress. This next page looks at the 10-year view. So the first number is our current budget, 40 million. The second number in the upper right is 50 million. Uh, it's actually 56 million. That would be a, approximately a 10-year growth pattern, again, at 3.25%. But look at the bottom chart. 
you see what happens with the debt and capital spending. Because of the increase in the budget, again targeting 6% towards debt and capital, we now have a gray bar that's higher than our red bar. And the, the red bar is the debt payment in 2025. The blue bar representing the amount of money we budgeted to pay for debt and capital. Along the way with the plan that we've provided here, we're making cash contributions to capital. So we're not just completely saddled by the debt that you see on the first chart where we can't make any capital investment. This also assumes we don't issue any new debt, which is unlikely over the next 10 years, but it presents a path, a, a plan to get somewhere. There may be a few variations along the way, um, but right now we don't even have that plan, and I think it's part of why the town has that 14 to 17 percent burden uh, that it has today, because it hasn't, hasn't focused on the long view. Next slide uh, talks about some of that. Uh, what we've done is we've recognized that the previous way we did capital planning left a lot to be desired. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was inconsistent expertise on the committee. There was a lack of timeliness because it was a volunteer group. Um, they didn't necessarily meet and provide the information when the town needed it to be most effective in its decision making. The board has substituted an employee uh, driven group in its place and it's made up of six people who are subject matter experts both in capital investment and also in the financial end of it. So we're combining those, that information from the schools, the facilities department, DPW and so on and coming up with a strong, uh, a strong focused committee that's moving forward very quickly. We meet weekly to come up with the details that are in that spreadsheet, the ones we won't be reviewing in any great detail tonight. Um, the plan is to meet, continue to meet regularly until we get the fiscal 16 budget in place. So pretty much weekly for the next few months. Uh, after that, a group like this should continue to meet probably quarterly. Uh, capital priorities can change due to emergencies. Revenues can change, free cash can be allocated. So there's reasons for the group to stay involved and not just look at it on a budgetary basis once a year. Uh, but quarterly is probably frequently enough. The group has focused a lot of its attention on capital prioritization. Um, if you look at the spreadsheets, the items you see in the fiscal 15 and fiscal 16 columns are the priorities. That's why they're in the immediate uh, next two years of spending. How they got there is based on uh, how the committee evaluated them. So you see the, uh, the bullet points there. Critical items uh, are listed first, as I said. We looked at community or employee safety as a high priority item. Uh, the end of the useful life of the item. Um, if, it's, if it's really already past its uh, uh, safe to eat date, <laughs> it's, it's time for us to replace it. Uh, but also the readiness of the projects. If, if we can move on it now, it might have gotten a, a slightly higher ranking than some other project that we really would like to do, but we're really not ready to talk about it in any kind of detail. We haven't done all the planning required. We also uh, considered the cost of not purchasing the item. So, you know, perhaps we really want a new dump truck, but we could get another couple of years out of the one we have. So that affected the prioritization as well. But when you don't buy something, there's often a cost. And at some point, the increase, say, maintenance cost on an item or the safety uh, concerns with a, with a deteriorating product require us to uh, put it up higher on the priority list. The life cycle costs were also considered uh, different than the cost of not purchasing them. This is more, uh, the new item is going to have a higher maintenance cost uh, moving forward, or perhaps the older item will have the higher maintenance cost. We wanted to look at all of those things and not just make sort of snap decisions that something's 10 years old, it's time to replace it. And then funding sources. Um, our facilities manager just received a $125,000 grant for uh, lighting, green lighting uh, community items that were talked about last meeting. Um, because it was funded, those items went right to the top of the list. So that's fairly obvious, but part of how we looked at all of the information that you'll see on the spreadsheet. And now we have some recommendations. Um, 
in addition to this capital planning process that I just presented, um, we feel that the town needs to come up with a capital funding process. And this group can make some of those recommendations. I've made a few tonight. You've heard me speak about some of the ideas, but the uh, impetus for that funding needs to come from this board and from our FinCom. Uh, the critical one is using the retiring debt. That's not something that um, a committee can just sort of say, yeah, we're going to grab that $100,000 as it falls off the uh, debt rolls. Uh, it needs to be a commitment from the town that it stays parked in there as cash moving forward. And then um, we'd like to make a final recommendation, maybe not final, but <laughs> an additional recommendation that um, the Board of Selectmen create a building committee for the Maynard Fire Department. And uh, the reason this came out of the committee is that uh, it's the biggest capital item on the list, um, as you, you will see. Um, we feel that um, the planning for building a fire department will take somewhere between six months and a year. And that in perhaps about a year, the town may be in a position financially to actually fund a fire department. Uh, it may require a little more debt but there's uh, a decent amount of money moving into stabilization funds, and we may be able to make this happen. Um, if that's the case, we're hesitant to wait until we know we have all the money in the bank to then start planning, because essentially we would then lose another year. But if a group can be appointed, start putting the details together on what that building would look like, some of its specific costs, within a few months' time, we may be able to make decisions to move forward with that plan and therefore replace that aging structure that much more quickly. So that's the, uh, that's the end of that presentation. If you would like to look at the spreadsheet ever so briefly, just the summary page is the first page of the spreadsheet. Um, you will see at the top summary information on all the different uh, departments that have contributed to the capital plan. And along the bottom of the spreadsheet, there's a number of tabs and colors, and those are the details of each of those departments. So this, this first page shows you all the high-level summary information all in one place. The top part is the capital spending. The bottom portion is the capital funding. You'll see, for instance, down near the bottom of the page, the $125,000 for the lighting that I mentioned a few minutes ago. To the extent that money has been allocated, it may appear in both sides of the spreadsheet. So for instance, the uh, golf course debt payment is part of the $5.6 million we're spending this year. But it's also part of the funding in the lower portion because the CPA appropriated those funds. So we're not sort of you know, playing a shell game. If, if it's in the top section be, with dedicated funding grants or otherwise, we, uh, we show that in the bottom. Um, that's about as much detail as I care to show you there. Um, as you look through the spreadsheet in more detail and you have questions, I'd be happy to respond uh, in person, over the phone, via email. It's a lot to digest, and we're not expecting to decipher it all tonight. Uh, quick question. Sure. Have you scheduled an opportunity to meet with FinCom to discuss this, and if so, when? Yes, Peter Campbell has invited uh, me to attend, us to attend. Uh, April, uh, sorry, August 25th, which I believe is their next meeting. Uh, it's a Monday evening, and um, I'll be going over this presentation, but also a little bit more of the detail in the spreadsheet uh, at that time. And have they already, or as of t as of this moment, been had this shared with them at least the spreadsheet? Or no. are you going to present that to them at the time that you? No, I I reached out to Peter and asked that. Uh, we be able to make this presentation. Okay. Um, I didn't want to present this, the PowerPoint to them before you had seen it, and it was still being worked on the past few days. Yep. Um, the spreadsheet is a living, breathing document. It'll be different again on August 25th than it is today. Um, I would be happy to share this with them well in advance of that meeting, but they'll get the most up-to-date copy that night. Okay. So, Andrew, I got a couple of questions on the... Um the slides and the, the program. Maybe one thing I didn't quite understand. I thought you said the retiring debt would be kept as 
cash. But I kind of thought the point was the retiring debt was just not reallocated to some other department. So, yeah, so right now, um, and I'm not trying to say this as a, uh, that it was wrong or that it was uh, always done this way. But, but most recently, let's say $100,000 of non-excluded debt was paid off. That $100,000 was now part of next year's base budget that we can increase by 2.5%. And the, the town departments were told to submit their budgets, and everybody was asked to hold in the reins, as we always do. But that $100,000 was part of the spending package that then moved forward. But it was not kept in a, a bucket or a budget called, say, capital. Essentially, I'm, I'm advocating that we have a department of capital, just like we have a police department and other departments. And that, that department holds on to that money. It doesn't get distributed to the schools and the police and the fire and town offices. It's theirs. So Their job is to spend it on these things on the, on the spreadsheet. Yeah, so, so if I may reword it just to make sure I understand, um, based on so, so right now we've allocated, well, the, the, I think you said we're at 14, we're at 14 percent, right, um, plus 3 percent allocated to capital. So even if you consider this, this debt retirement um, recommendation, that means five years from now, um, you know, 17 percent is allocated to capital. The, now, the, the difference is and this is really important, I think, or at least the difference as I understand it, is I'm not necessarily servicing debt um, over that five, 10 years. As I get further to that 10 year period, I'm actually saving money to, to spend on capital items as opposed to servicing debt. Well, because I'm not reallocating it back to like operational expenses. You're not, but the, di the difference uh, is that it's not the 17%. So let, let's assume. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, let's, you assume get down the, to let's assume the three percent that we're spending in cash now is is appropriated into this capital budget, and then the amount of the non-excluded retiring debt. So most of our debt, especially in the short term, is excluded, and that's why you don't see that first chart change very quickly. Around 2022 or 2023, Actually, we have a balloon payment, and we pay off over a million dollars in one year, and then. Uh, then the, the balance of excluded debt and non-excluded debt is more equal. And then we start seeing those numbers start to escalate. Mm -hmm. So you're right in the concept, but it's, it doesn't, it's not a 17% bucket. It's each year it's going to go down to say 13.5, you know, 11.5 as we do pay off the debt. And the part that's excluded is going back to the taxpayers. It's no longer in the tax base. Okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry. As you were starting to explain, I realized I misunderstood it. So, sure. So, thank you for the uh, but for the everyone else's edification. <laughs> okay. To be clear, that, this does include, that, that does include sure. It, which is why it's a forty million dollar base budget in my explanation, and not the thirty six that you right. might be more conversationally familiar with, because all those enterprise debt is also in the the debt payment we make. And, so we included the target, revenue. The six percent includes enterprise debt. Mm -hmm. It includes the enterprise debt. Um, I was curious if it included um, Astabet debt. It does not. The, I don't um, even know if it's I, a significant amount. But. Yeah, I, actually, yeah, I need to I need to relook at the uh, spreadsheet. The Astabet debt right now is pretty modest, and we it is going to rise quickly. I think two years from now, fiscal seventeen is it, Kevin? Yeah, we do, yeah. We, yeah, uh, I thought um, it was like 250 for a good like 20 years or so. Right. That that is in there and it is non-excluded, so it hurts the numbers. If I if you had seen these numbers like in May, they looked a lot more generous, because that 250 wasn't in there, and so it it was basically our money. It was our cash. Now we have to pay it out to Asabet because it is non-excluded, mm -hmm. so it's it doesn't. We don't get the benefit from that until that gets paid off in, I don't know when it is, 2031 or something. Under the process that you're describing and you take the debt, you know, the, whatever falls off our debt and you're currently we redistribute it out among the other departments. As a result of not doing that and instead building this other bucket of, or other department, what would be the impact on the taxpayer? 
as far because you still have to fill the buckets that are no longer being assisted with that say it's a hundred thousand dollars one year that that comes off the rolls that we used to put out into a uh, you know, a blanket out and share it among all of the other departments. Would the taxpayer be required to fill that hundred thousand dollar hole that year, or how does that work? Well, we're all well aware of our uh, finance limitations with Proposition Two and a Half. So, you know, we can sit here today and and consider what our budgets are going to look like for four or five years on the revenue side, notwithstanding state aid and maybe some increases in local receipts. But, but we can very accurately predict the property tax revenue for the next five, 10 years. Um, what we're talking about is redistributing that money within, within that group of people that get to spend it. So if that number is right now, our property tax revenue is about 27 million. So we're saying uh, 86,000 is gonna be retired, uh, non-excluded debt next year. That's coming off that 27 million. So that's, the, everybody in town has to live with the, re, the rest of that money. The, 20, the 86000 is going to stay over here. Okay. Um, that would also be subject to the 25 increase. So that eighty six would then become, say, 88000 the next year, plus that year's non-excluded retiring debt. That's a really fun but, phrase but to say over is, and over there, again. It sounds like there's <laughs> no impact on I don't think it's there's no, no tax savings for the taxpayer. Well, the, there's money, no, the money I'm, is just I'm concerned about the other direction. somewhere else. Yeah, the, the tax savings to the taxpayer would be the interest on the non-excluded retiring debt. Um, and that other budgets aren't growing faster than yep. uh, Proposition Two and a Half intended. Whether or not we agree with that or feel it's fair or whatever, it's still it's holding in the reins of municipal expansion. And uh, this continues. So it to would require some additional discipline from the board. That's right, because we can't expand faster than that. Yes, we're just okay. asking that it gets spent gotcha. in a way that eliminates us or, or reduces the likelihood that we're going to look for more debt financing in the future. And in the long run, that's gonna be healthier for the town. Okay. Because those interest payments will get redistributed if they don't get taken off the tax rolls. Well, and actually, yes, <laughs> so, so, if I, so if I could though, uh, over the next 10 years, you're looking that all the retiring debt would be, would be held back and, um, and or reducing the overall um, debt burden to the municipality. Yeah, we, we don't retire at all in 10 years. I only took the map out for 10. Yeah, no, but, no, 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 that's yeah. fine. But, but my point is, is, is the ratio that you were describing goes down. Some of it is held back. Some of it is to lower the tax burden. But none of it's to go back to clarify, unlike what we've done in past years, none of it necessarily goes back to um, other town departments. Well, this is a plan, yeah, and, and if we accept it at its face value and let's you know simple numbers, it's a hundred thousand bucks a year, and and we move on. There might be some year where we say, you know what, it's more important that we use some of that money or all that money for this other department that needs this feature, and we're going to forego some of the capital spending this year. But again, that's a decision the town can make year to year, and in a, in a healthy financial environment, it might be an easy decision to make. Right now, you got a $5.6 million debt payment to make, and you better not miss it. <laughs> no, you know, you don't, you don't have any flexibility with that, with that debt anchor on your neck. Yeah. I mean, and let's be clear also, you know, I'm sorry. Right. We're talking about this debt we're retiring, and it's going into, and it's great, you've basically built yourself a capital improvement revolving fund. But yeah. kind of that's what it is. We're not going to stop doing a, a capital improvements anytime soon. The debt that you're getting, the money that you're getting back that's no longer going to debt service is sure as heck gonna go to the next capital improvement, the next piece of equipment, the next building. Without so, interest. So effectively, you know, that, I don't wanna say that money's gone, but you know, it, it's basically your, your level funding through the, the tax base and you're not paying interest at this point. At some point, I assume you probably look at potentially earning interest on some of it. And well, what I mean when I said not paying interest, meaning you're not paying the finance charges because correct. you're paying yeah. cash for things. But so, in, t in ten years, when we get to that six percent mark, right, that we're servicing six percent of of debt, right? Right. Okay. Given that we're currently at you know fourteen percent, 
you know, as you explained it before, it's not like that that eight percent differential is now going to be spent on capital, right? I mean, we've we've inherently first of all, I, I appreciate the whole um, we no longer have to pay interest on that 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 you know we're removing eight percent of interest that we currently pay, but since you're not reallocating it to other departments, you're effectively over the course of ten years reducing. And again, if I'm misunderstanding, please clarify. You're reducing the le the the burden on on the taxpayers by that eight percent at the end of the ten years. In, in in simple terms, your math is right. Yeah, that that's the that's the excluded debt that's going away permanently. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yes. So, okay. that is a permanent reduction to the taxpayer. It, you know, until the town does another override and has more excluded debt. But those those are things that will happen naturally over the course of years anyway what this is this premise is is to say let's let's do our financing as in the most healthy way we can and that that target of six percent is a good one to have a conversation about but if we go around that number and we get there in about 10 years then we can have those healthy discussions about giving extra funding to a certain department in one year or whatever because instead of spending all this money on debt, we've got a lot of flexibility in that same budget. Well, and, and I may be confusing excluded and non-excluded, right? So in the case of non-excluded debt, which, you know, some percentage of this 14% is non-excluded, some is excluded, right? So so if we go with the non-excluded debt, um, over the course of 10 years, we're going to migrate away from, from debt service and therefore paying interest to that current percentage of the town budget that's spent on non-excluded debt will be allocated to like a capital department. So Did I say that correctly? Yeah, so not notwithstanding all the other details of the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, but I'm it, talking but about the, the, down the, the, road, the we, high level vision. Right, the high, the high level, we've got, you know, 10 years from now, we get through this plan and we've got about a $3 million budget every year to spend on capital. Maybe the town has some debt, Maybe it's paying cash for everything. But it has $3 million budgeted for investment in equipment and facilities. Um, and it just keeps moving forward because it's got, it's got a number that's healthy relative to its entire budget. The other 84% of the budget is going to all those things that you're talking about. And the next year it's going to be 84% plus the two and a half yep. and so on. So those departments aren't getting sort of... Um, unfunded all along this 10-year plan. We're simply taking the money that's being uh, cannibalized by debt and saying, when you get that little bit of breathing room, don't throw it around, hold on to it, because you're gonna need it. You're gonna no. need it next year or the year after. So thank you, I, I think I'm now uh, less foggy on the overall plan. Um, but other, if I may, I mean, overall I think it's, Wish we did it ten years ago, right? But you know, we could all wish, right? Uh, and I guess, um, so I, I, I agree with the overall strategy personally. Um, obviously, it'd be interesting to get FinCom's perspective on it, as my colleagues have mentioned. And then um, I'd be interested. Um, while I think it does take a little bit of while to plan for a fire uh, station, um, understanding how. If we go spend six, seven million dollars on a fire station, um, how that rolls into to this overall recommendation you've provided, and whether whether or not, again, that would, you know, I think our hope was is a, ma a majority, quote unquote, of the fire station construction would be funded through, like capital stabilization, and then are we looking? And you may not have a definitive answer. I presume are we looking at that point? There's if we can fund it all out of capital stabilization, stabilization, that'd be great. If not, then would all we'd empty, quote unquote, capital stabilization and look for the rest to be funded via excluded debt. And that's a that's an open question that maybe the, you don't. Those have an aren't answer. decisions that I would make. Um, I would say that um, the the purpose of the building committee starting sooner rather than later is that um, in a conversation with the fire chief that if we like many times if you do a study or you do design work and then you wait two or three years you feel like you have to do the design again because so much has changed um, he doesn't feel that that's the case in the construction of a fire department so that he would rather have that project ready to go when the town says we've got the money we've got the location 
go and not have to then wait another year before he's really ready to go. And I support that viewpoint. Um, you know, we may find that we change the, the color of the shutters on the new building, but I don't see a dramatic change in design uh, from doing it, say, in, in fiscal 15 versus doing it in fiscal 16 or 17. And I do think we will have potentially the money to build it uh, with cash or a modest debt issuance, um, which could be done in a one-year debt exclusion, for instance, uh, in fiscal 16 or 17. I guess, so thank you. Uh, my only other question in that regards is that uh, assuming the board looks to form that committee in the short term, um, presumably they would need some level of technical support. I mean, are there some consultants and some allocation of funds that we'd have to consider? Because, you know, a purely volunteer committee for something like this, not belittling for a moment the, the professionalism and expertise of the fire department, um, they don't build f fire stations. Now, the chief uh, would expect to have a, uh, an architect or a design okay. professional involved. And do you know what the scale of that expense would be? He's uh, given me numbers that are in the mid five figures or less. Okay. Um, we would have to really shop that around, but I think that's probably accurate, 20, 40,000, somewhere in that range. I just want an order of magnitude. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute, 20 or 4,000 for what? The architect is to assist the committee. Architect plans on a $6 million facility? No, I assume uh, you mean just, just the, the initial assistance. Design. Uh, you can you can add a zero to those numbers based on prior experience. You know, we start with a twenty thousand study, and he's like, "Well, I got us this far. We need more money." You know, and then we give him another forty, and it's like, "Oh, yeah, you already spent sixty, so now we, you spend." We wouldn't years. expect movement from this committee without more yeah. detailed information in there. It's it's just, they they. I want to look at the police station. So, somewhat like Angus Jennings' uh, work with the, the previous committee in the town, where there's uh, facilitating the process to get to the decisions of where, what size, some of the features. So you're looking at this initial committee. This is not a design committee. This is a quantify the, the need committee. That didn't really sound that great. But it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, the, it's the what is the need. And, and, you know, we need this number of beds. We need this size bays for the whole equipment and so quantify that need I, I think the fire chief can tell you that now I think it's the next step after that but not the detailed architectural drawings so conceptual drawings uh, as well as perspective locations because we have to put it somewhere obviously and then then order a magnitude cost associated with implementing the, the the concept at those locations is that kind of what you're thinking that sounds about right okay um, I'm looking forward to a uh, exciting discussion on August 25th at the FinCom, but uh, just one heads up. Drink your coffee. I'm going to ask you, <laughs> I'm going to want to know if we had implemented this last year, what the fiscal 15 budget would look like this year? As far um, as I can give you that, but I'll have to look it up. But we did, yeah. I have the numbers from 14 to what 15 would look like. I can figure it out for you. Would you like that tonight? I would not. I really don't want you to say things twice. So <laughs> it's fine. You can just say it and that time. was a much more succinct, succinct question to ask the same point that I was trying to make with my initial comment. Yeah, because this money is coming from some service. That's the point. Yeah. 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 We'll see. Hey, this is excellent. Thank you. All right. Item number 17, yeah. our, our inaugural economic development update agenda. 15? Is it? Nope. 17. 17. Oh, I'm looking at. And uh, Kevin's now. promised me all sorts of, of, of exciting and uh, hopeful information. Oh, that I don't know. It's only so much I can pull out. OK. Um, but no, I'd certainly provide uh, some of the updates, some of which you um, on the economic development side of things, uh, I think the big elephant in the room that, you know, before we talk about some positive stuff is the uh, closing of Walgreens. Um, closed down last week, uh, removed the signage. And um, we have since followed up with uh, a leasing group, got some messages in there, looking to um, have discussions with 
those folks see what the intent is. At this point, it, it's still unclear whether they're, they're looking to lease the building, whether they're looking to sell the building. Um, nice home for the food co-op. Yeah, there's hope for the food co-op, sure. Um, the cost may be uh, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty it's prohibitive. Um, what comes to mind uh, is, a, is a, another small market that just recently opened last weekend in Medfield um, called Brothers Market. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to I would recommend getting there. It's it's sort of a small scale model of Whole Foods, ready prepared foods, hot f items, but it's a subset of Roach Brothers, and it's their first uh, kind of project. But it, something like a Brothers Market, which is uh, part of the Roach Brothers family, um, and the first one that just opened is in is in Medfield, and it's very much like our our layout and demographics, and you know walkable. It's right in the center. You got a parking lot in the back, but it's uh, I went there just to, to see the setup and see how it is, and, and after walking through the this this would this is this would be perfect for me. And it, um, similarly, you know, a co-op could also act in that place. I just don't know that timing-wise that uh, any place like that is that any organization or group like that is going to be ready to act on uh, this. But part of that will be um, when we get some feedback from the. Uh, real estate group. We've left a few different groups within the Walgreens organization and some contacts and we'll open this week to get uh, an idea from them because certainly that's other than Clock Tower, it's our largest uh, you know, downtown retailer space, about 23,000 square feet um, up yep. and down. Yeah, but they don't use the upstairs. They don't, but the next person could. So there's 20, you know, 22, 23,000 square feet available. They're utilizing uh, a small room for security equipment and storage, but how big is this building? Has the potential. <laughs> so, yeah. Make a great town hall. Damn, I don't think we, I don't think we, too. I don't think we could afford it. They do have a an elevator to the second floor, by the they way. They do. It's fully. Uh, it's not finished. It, it's, it's. I know. Uh, <laughs> they never did finish it. Yeah. It's. Uh, they have wallboard up, but it's not plastered. It's about the extent of what's done in there, but. Fairly short money could do that, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's got a lot of great advantages um, as a as a community asset. But you know, again, the cost may be prohibitive. Those are sort of some of the things we want to know. What are, what are they actually looking for? All right, so look forward um, to finding out something. Yeah, uh, I don't know if anybody was on Waltham Street today. Started the demolition of the uh, former Oriental Delight project. Um, they started that today. And uh, we have not seen, the town has not received any f actual uh, submittals, um, plans. Um, we've looked at some preliminary stuff several months ago uh, where they're looking to potentially uh, construct, uh, likely will be to construct residential um, a, uh, on the parking lot across the street. Um, they were looking at possibly a, a uh, duplex and a single family. And then on the restaurant side, they were looking at putting in two triplexes. Um, it would be six, six units. Um, we don't know, again, what the owner's uh, final submittal will look like. I know they did bring it before the uh, building commissioner, and they were going to go back and make some tweaks on what, what they could do there. Um, but the demo did start today, and um, it's probably, at this point, it's probably down. Uh, when, we were by, when we were by there, they had done the uh, entire back end. Already, so. Yeah, they still got ways to go. I yeah, yeah. By on the way here. So they'll probably through the week um, at some point they'll at least have it down and then they'll be doing the uh, cleanup. Um, the other item, uh, 109 Parta Mill, um, that's the uh, climate controlled self storage unit 24 7 operation. Um, they've got permits, they've been in there um, doing some uh, gutting and, and rebuild. Um, primarily will be cage style storage units, um, but it will be 24-7 access and uh, it will have an on-site um, person 24-7 uh, for the property. Um, we don't have a definitive time frame on when they'll be done, but they have, they're fully engaged in the rebuild. Um, also, not too far from there, the rebuild, uh, full renovation of the former Peyton's restaurant. Um, is underway. They have building permits for that. They're doing uh, via an advanced auto parts that will be moving into that space. And none of the other tenant space is, is included in that. It's just the uh, Peyton's restaurant um, itself and then the, I think some receiving 
area that they had in the back. So it'll be the restaurant and some receiving. But the full footprint of Peyton's? Yeah. Yep. And it'll be advanced. Um, Um, yeah, it would be advanced auto parts, and again, we don't have a, uh, a time frame when they're going to be ready to be open, but they're, uh, it's coming. Uh, we'll be going in, so we do, uh, what else do I have? Uh, 124 Acton Street, the uh, crime lab, um, that expansion is underway. They're expanding into some space in the back that allows for uh, expanded training room uh, as well as uh, some other facilities uh, I think so, improved um, improved cafeteria facility and some other stuff I believe um, so they'll be occupying a, a greater portion the state uh, police will be occupying a greater portion of that building um, and then uh, of course uh, wouldn't be complete with the 129 Parker Street update uh, not much to add to that other than that um, uh, Selectman uh, Chetwin and Cranshaw, as well as um, myself, Andrew, and uh, Bill Nemser, the town planner, um, will be meeting with uh, representatives from 129 Parker Street tomorrow evening uh, to discuss the project and potential um, on the residential side of things. So we'll have more to report on that uh, at our next meeting for the board. And uh, last item I have on under economic development is just. Uh, let the board know that the kickoff uh, for the Economic Development Committee um, is uh, planned for next Tuesday, actually a week from today, at 8.30 a.m. on uh, August 12th um, with that group. So that's going to be making some headway, and certainly all, all of these uh, items and, and big projects will be, uh, will be discussed there as well. Anything Very good. Thank you. else there you have? No. Any questions? Yeah, two quick ones. The uh, TA report. The planning board, uh, uh, the Oriental Delight site. Yes. Uh, you said that went to the building commissioner? I think he saw a preliminary plan several okay. months ago. I don't think anything's, nothing's been submitted. Okay, I was going to say that that should end up, I would assume we'll end up going to the planning board for a yeah, change absolutely. of use. Absolutely. Okay. I think uh, before he did that, he had a preliminary conceptual idea and wanted to get the building commissioner, um, zoning enforcement officer's opinion on whether he thinks uh, particular use and locations would work. Um, he made some recommendations on some tweaks that he thought you know would fit better, and he was going to go back and revamp. And uh, we're expecting, um, since the demo has already started, we would expect to see something soon to the planning board. Thank you. All right. Uh, no other questions? We can move on to uh, town administrator report. TA report. Um, of note, uh, Andrew and I met with uh, two representatives from the town of Stowe, Council on Aging, today, actually. Um, we had an uh, initial first meeting um, with the uh, Council on Aging director as well as the uh, chairman of the Council on Aging. Um, from Stowe to discuss uh, somewhat, you know, uh, initial conversations if, if, you know, if they, if they would be opposed to it, um, you know, kind of higher level, like what might this look like type of thing. Um, you know, how could we, you know, what would we predict the actual uh, formation looking like in a few different models, a potential, um, you know, just maybe the management of the COA and us having more of a, uh, a local outreach coordinator and kind of managing services or if it's sort of a, a full move of the COA combined combination of a regional director type of piece. And we threw around a bunch of concepts. We met for about two hours. Um, again, it was an initial meeting. There's still a lot of questions on the table um, as to how that would work, but it's our first, um, you know, at least it's our first step. Um, I think as I indicated prior, we've, uh, we've reached out to um, the town administrator, had conversations with the town administrator, and um, he was of the mindset that it should be driven from the bottom up. Um, so we've started really with the COA director, and uh, neither of the two of them were opposed to it, and uh, we had some great conversation. Um, some of the, you know, obviously for the town of Stowe, it's what's in it for us, and most of that is monetary. Um, but we also did, uh, 
did discuss, uh, there's still some unknowns there, but um, potential uh, grant money for regionalization projects that could be, um, could be beneficial to both the town of Maynard and the town of Stowe and some other opportunities um, through you know, maybe an intermunicipal agreement where um, there's an assessment that the town of Maynard would pay Stowe for services. Um, but again, very preliminary. Um, it's the first discussion. Um, it, we hope to uh, kind of come back with a couple of options and, and have them uh, bring it up their chain um, as was asked to do. I know, uh, I think at least a couple members of the Board of Selectmen over there have, uh, have heard of you know, the interest. Um, we have not, Andrew nor I have spoken directly with any Selectmen, but um, we, have, uh, we have initiated conversation with, with the two of them as well as uh, the town administrator. Um, if I could just to that one brief point I've spoke to Tom Ryan and Charlie Kern, Kern. Mm -hmm. uh, about this informally but I spoke to them about it okay um, so more to come we don't know I mean it, you know, it, we want to go through the motions and see if it's a viable um, op opportunity uh, some of that is dictated on you know what what what's our next step on what, how we move forward um, for not only now currently but in future FY 16 um, and beyond if it's a, a case where we're looking at a, a full-time director and, and actually investing some uh, more money into a council on aging department uh, locally building it up with new leadership here um, there's been a lot of uh, changes at, at the leadership level with the uh, Council on Aging themselves, new members. They did elect, uh, or did vote to appoint uh, a new chairman of the Council on Aging. Um, actually, the gentleman that the board appointed at our last meeting, Edson, what's his first name? John. John, John Edson. So they, they do have some new leadership. They do have some new energy. Um, Andrew's been working with them quite a bit too. Uh, so it's been good. We just want to, we don't want to make decisions that you know, later on, you know, we, we got to deal with, uh, we want, we're trying to do it methodically. Um, Could I just, I'm sorry, before you go on to the next item, Kevin, just a clarification on the COA. So presumably the, the current plan is to, is to hold off on uh, filling the COA director position until some of these other conversations flush out a bit more? A little if, bit. We, we're having that direct. Right now, um, yeah, we're not we're not doing what we should be doing in the sense of programs and things like that. But we're not doing any less than we were. Um, uh, fortunately, Andrew's stepped in quite a bit as far as the management level of it, keeping the ship afloat. Um, it, the, the direction may be that you know maybe we look towards a uh, a part twenty hour a week um, uh, senior coordinator, something like that. Um, as opposed to a COA director. Uh, I definitely have concerns with looking to hire, uh, you know, beyond necessarily an interim position, a COA director at 20 hours a week at what we have. I think the, the quality of candidates is gonna be extremely poor and the interest is gonna be extremely low. Um, not, to, you know, not to mention um, it's a small world and everyone knows what other communities' issues are. And, and for somebody to take a position like that, that they're walking into, or there has not been a CUA director for X number of months, and you know, it's, it's no secret to surrounding towns, the operation of, of Maynard's Council on Aging. So I'm, I'm a little concerned of what we would get to go out and throw out the CUA director position. So we've been talking about that. We have a job description in essence, ready to go, but maybe the direction is to kind of keep the management structure where it is, leadership, and go the direction of like a, an outreach worker um, that's still accessible 20 hours a week until we can really figure it out. Um, you know, if it's something like a regional director um, or if it's something like we really need to build up our own um, you know, COA management structure. So, I, yeah, I think to answer that question, um, Brendan, is that we're, we're still kind of seeing where pieces fall. That's part of the methodical decision making that we're trying to do. Thank you. Um, as far as the golf course uh, goes, uh, there's a you know, walkthrough meeting. Uh, Andrew's meeting with the facilities manager out there. This ties in with the COA to look at um, 
what the potential investment uh, with just the conversation we've had prior on the backspace um, and what you know what what requirements would be there uh, to make that usable and to be able to put some numbers on that. So we'll have more of an idea. That's the club, the uh, clubhouse uh, space for potential senior use. Have uh, we worked out the um, the uh, issues regarding eligibility of use? You had mentioned that we hadn't really set the restrictions for the parcel yet. Yeah, we have, and, and we actually discussed that with uh, town council um, when she had office hours on Thursday. We met with her quite a bit about that was one of the primary. That's still a viable idea. Yeah, That's it all is. Yeah. It is. We're looking. Um, when we do the restriction, it may be that the clubhouse is carved out of the restriction and the rest of it is. But yeah, it is a viable um, idea. Okay. And I think it's something that we're seriously looking at pushing forward. So I um, just want to let the board know we're working uh, as much as possible, trying to get early in on uh, discussions with Maya. Um, we met with uh, our representative um, from Maya last week and you know, continue to look at um, opportunities where we can reduce our health care costs. When does that come up uh, for renewal? For uh, well, it's, it's based it on... Like we just got the number. We did. Yeah, I mean, the renewal is July 1. Um, but the problem is based on, on the way the data is, if there's any plan changes, yeah. that needs to happen several months before yep. the actual okay. renewal. And a um, couple of things that we're excited about is potentially uh, moving forward with a slight change to um, retirees that we're still exploring that really does not have an impact to uh, you know, the retiree. Um, in any real negative way, we're looking at changing uh, potentially a, a medics plan that could result in, uh, the only change to it is it deals with some prescription directive stuff, but it's, uh, it's manageable, nothing uh, real exciting, but it, it's a uh, potential considerable savings for the town um, that we're, we're hoping that that piece may be able to move forward and we'll be able to free up some, some real money uh, from that. And then, uh, looking continue to look at slight changes uh, particularly to the ppo plan um for for the subscribers there but it's uh it's definitely something that's on our radar it's one of our um highest budget drivers and uh you know we continue to explore opportunities to uh make the best of it including conversations with our consultant uh art bombagin and um uh, gloria are involved with those conversations as well from millennium um Anything you want to add to that? Uh, one of the things we're getting from Maya and Cabot is uh, and Art's going to sort of vet it for us is a comparison yeah. to not using Maya. And, you know, Look at some comparisons to, uh, against, to say the GIC or benchmarks to the GIC plan and some other, you know, self insured, um, <laughs> those opportunities. We, we, the town was previously self insured. But we we're, we want to, you know, we're putting our best foot forward to really look at um, you know, a real cost for the town, how we can continue to offer benefits that we need to, but um, you know, look to control those costs. And it, it may be that you know, at the end of the day, Meyer is the best option for us, and, um, but we wanna go through the motion. So um, the other th last thing I have on is uh, the McDonald uh, development uh, project, uh, old project at Parker, Waltham Street. Um, we're still, there has been a filing of uh, civil action filing, and uh, we're still at this point wait, awaiting a superior court um, summons for when, when that'll be before. Um, there's a number of findings that were cited in the filing um, with regards to that property. I don't know, Jason, if you're, it has to do with the, um, the planning board, uh, the, the agreement um, for the Waltham Street uh, Parker Street corner of the development project with uh, some sidewalk improvements, lighting, um, some other things. The board had given uh, given McDonald Development um, a uh, addendum to the original, which said that it needed to be completed by July 30th of 2014. And the agreement was executed, but um, we weren't given a. Uh, uh, the other piece of that was a uh, surety bond. We weren't given. Uh, we weren't given any anything there. So. Um, it's now at the court. I can say I am familiar with it, but it was before my time. Yeah. Now it's part of your time. 
No, it's excellent. Welcome to the club. Just a different Hello, board. Were you, were you on the planning board when the uh, when that, that project was before me? I'm sorry. Were you? I'm the old guy on yeah. campus. You were on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm well versed in it. I'm just before I was there. Well, you were on with the Main Street project, Correct. which we've been dealing with trying to get things done there, too. Not surprising. <laughs> so. so. All right. Anything Thank else? You. That's it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. That's it. All right. Uh, for the chairman's report, a uh, couple quick Being things probably. here. Sid is coming. Eight. I'll be able we to have go. our town administrator review sheets were distributed a while ago, and I kind of think we should probably get them in by the next week. I think that's I think that's fair. So, based there's only three of us who who are contributing to that. Uh, so I'll compile the results. Um, so the way we've done it in years past is that the the chair or in my case the former chair compiles the results creates a summary report um, and then it's up to the individual members of the board to, to meet with the town administrator as they see fit to go over their specific comments and then at um, some meeting of the board of selectmen we could go through the, the public comments that that are in the summary report so again the individual comments themselves I believe are, are not uh, considered uh, um, have not been considered accessible to the public but the summary report has been that's my recollection so yeah so it would be really nice if we could wrap it up this calendar month since that's the anniversary <laughs> yeah um, I agree. So. I think I'm mostly talking to myself. As no, to I've, get I have done no, no. quickly. And I, I, back I emailed it to you. That's my accomplishment thus I far. I haven't. Um, <laughs> I've mentioned to Bill, I'm, we're doing the exact same thing at work. So it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on the same thing for my employees, and that takes precedent. So I have to get those done. All right. We're, we're worn, though. Okay. Um, other things is, let's see. I saw that we have a liquor license hearing next meeting although it doesn't look like it's anything exciting to the manager or something i saw some legal notice for that yes just uh everybody be prompt if we have one of those um i'm trying to get an issue that we talked about before david's idea about exploring options with the senior tax relief program like sudbury does and I'm trying to coordinate with uh, Kate Hogan um, to see if she has time to stop by and uh, educate us a little bit on on that and options. So hopefully I'll have uh, news on that before the next meeting. Um, and then two other topics because I love liquor licenses. Um, I believe the the state did pass the early opening Sunday morning for package stores and I was just curious from the board members on their their uh, thoughts on whether we would be proactive or reactive about that I mean do we go out and solicit opinions from the owners whether they want us to enable them to be open Sunday mornings or do we just wait until somebody asks? I think we should be proactive, my own opinion, proactive, ask them, and, uh, you know, then if, if there's a mixed reaction, regardless of what the reaction is, if there's a mixed reaction, we should have some type of hearing to allow them to express publicly what their concerns are. Well, we have two package stores, right? Yeah. Well, we have three. I'm sorry, we have three. Three. Is that correct? Four. No, this is... Main Street. Yes, this applies Bloods, to a lot Bloods, of people. Variety, Main these. Street, Marais. It also applies to variety stores. Yeah, because they could start selling out. So it's 10 o'clock versus noon, right? Yeah, I believe it is. Yes. Yeah, and Can many I? times when we make decisions like this, we're actually hurting our local businesses because they don't want, first off, they have to pay employees time that they may not have paid them already, so they lose that and they don't get the benefit back from the sales. There's also the competition issue that they're concerned yeah. about with competing okay. towns and whatever. So I think it's important to hear their perspective rather than just, yeah. you know, my general. I, I, I see I you like send a written. I, I think your idea of just sending a written letter to them and 
what are your thoughts? Or, or Ask re- them what their thoughts are. Reach out and, you know, because now that I talk about it out loud, I realize it's more than just a couple because it does apply to the variety stores. Um, I assume it was only for off-premises, right? Not on-premises? Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, with that being said, you know, what is there, it's like six or seven? Um, it's probably good to do a survey. And then um, whether it be a letter, I think, or they give a phone call, I don't really care, that's fine. Jason, your thoughts? Uh, can I get a clarification? If the legislature change the hours of sale it basically uh, allowable blue, blue hours law. allowable okay so we, we as local licensing authority get the final say prove that okay Correct. that was that was the clarification i was seeking and we've done it before you know mm-hmm. they've it's changed the hours and we, we've done it it's just, we're actually this allowed the liquor sales on sunday, sunday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right so okay in, like in that case sunday then morning. i'm okay with uh sending a letter and seeking their feedback all right, so proactive it is. All right, very good. Um, and then my last query to the board on um, liquor licenses is a comment that came up at last meeting in you know whether our local licensing regulations, which we just modified earlier today, um, are perhaps a bit too restrictive in regards to facilitating economic development, specifically how does a, a place planning on having a liquor license operate under our licensing, our local licensing agreements, which seem to indicate that we can't really help them unless they got a physical presence? Yeah, no, I think I brought that one up. And so I'm, just, I'm wondering. Just preliminary discussions with town councils, she felt that that was a state thing and that um, it wasn't too restrictive. That. That's, that's the requirement that they actually have a plan submitted or a place to uh, put it to. Well, I mean, the thing that gets me is I know they some communities do it I don't, with yeah. ideas and not I, I physical bricks. I think they're required so. to have not necessarily a building, but at least a plan submitted is what she told so me. So do they need to have... so? If I may, Bill. So, so this is the origin of the question, right? In the case of, of Parker Street, right? They not just a hypothetical no no it's so it's re it, it well it's not a hypothetical location but it's a hypothetical project right and they were arguing and we can argue the merits whether their their assertion is correct or not but that was not really the point uh is that if if a prospective developer and it could be anywhere says i can't get someone to sign a lease until i have a liquor license because again there there's not a lot of them now if we went the unlimited model that'd be a different discussion but we didn't go there yet so therefore how does someone like that plan for it if if we can't give what effectively is pocket licenses because they don't have a plan and they presumably won't have a plan because they don't have a lease you know i it's how does that sequencing work that some prospective development can get a license and that was the origin of my question right. So, Brendan, you've fallen into my trap because my point of bringing this That's up the only is the trap? hope that you would, you know, do a little bit of uh, uh, investigative into that issue. And uh, yeah, I did broach it with her. Help on, us understand a little Thursday better what we're, what we're doing to the, our developers and what we can help them with. Essentially, you got to have a, a some filing. You have, to have something. You have some sort of. I mean, even in your scenario. Um, Brennan, I mean, they still, they know where they're going to put something. And they don't necessarily pen a lease until they've at least started an application with the community. So, so yes. So, I, I mean, I don't need to finalize the conversation here. I'll take the action item to kind of, kind of mull it over and then poke around a little bit to see um, how one does it. Because it has to be able to be done. Maybe it's just like a preliminary sketch. But again, there's, a, there's kind of a chicken and the egg thing that I'm trying to understand. I think that's... The I bigger question that's kind of out there for the, uh, us as a community still is uh, getting a, an opinion or an answer on um, the determination of the location of schools and the licenses. And that, that's a big um, piece, particularly with the 129 project. Yeah. Determining whether that's building or um, property lines and still waiting on an opinion on that yeah, piece. I, mean, I, I rarely focus on specifics. I, try to focus on policy so I just like to know in general the reasons and we could yeah, but we could take Vic's point of 
of calling neighboring communities. She didn't no, think it was anything it. that was more restrictive than any other community. In fact, that it, um, she alluded to that was the, the minimum. That was the state requirement. Well, yeah, no. So I'm not even sure that I'm arguing the point that we're not in state compliance. But I've created, I've identified a scenario that's problematic. How do, how does one handle it? And maybe other communities have found a way within the law to provide to address that and it just comes down from a policy perspective what the policy making board wants to do but from a legality I'd like to know what the mechanics could be so yes I'll take that action item all right thank you very much um, that's what I got so we'll do um, old new and uh, David nothing nothing nice uh, Jason um. Brendan's Brendan's no, surprised. No, no, that's, that's okay. We're good. I'm bouncing. Right, you can get worried. No, no, uh, no. That's fine. I'll go. And I have a few, and I'll make them very brief. Uh, one I attended with David actually was there the seven four uh, seven twenty four school committee meeting. Uh, I'm just passing this along to anyone who sees this meeting. There's a request for host families in Maynard. Uh, to host uh, foreign, uh, I guess they were used to be called exchange students. Uh, and you may contact the school committee or the superintendent's office for that. Uh, also, one that I may be stealing from Brendan is that uh, the Maynard May Dog Dog Park is scheduled to open this week, Saturday, at 1 p.m. Um, okay. uh, it's on my list. <laughs> you need to rent a dog? Or, uh, I'll loan you one. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. That's why there's a few of us up here. I think, uh, Kevin, one that I'm kind of holding off here partially for the goals meeting, but uh, you brought it up tonight uh, regarding blight. Uh, I'd like us to start taking a look at removal or deconstructing of uh, deconstruction of condemned or abandoned buildings. We I've, have a, we have a few that have been hanging around for a lot. I could for a minute. I'd like to yeah put that back on as a discussion for future agenda. I had the. Uh, again, a preliminary conversation with town council on that uh, item as well. On Thursday, um, she felt that the existing one that was drafted was pretty aggressive, and the, the best alternative around it would be to deal with it through commercial buildings and or like residentials of five units or more, and to deal with the residential issues through uh, other building code, health code options. Um, but it's easier to get a, a blight bylaw to deal with commercial space like, um, you know, Murphy building. Yeah, no, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm basically yeah. what I'm bringing up. I'm trying to put a little bit of a separation between the blight and the safety issues. Yeah, we do have build. There's, there's at least one that I can name that it is basically falling apart and it's sat that way now for 10 years. And it's it's a hazard. It's trespassers. It's a hazard, and I think we need to start looking at keeping those things from just lingering. All right. Well, I'll see if I can work it into next meeting's agenda. You know, anything else? Uh, I got a couple of minor things, but um, oh, real quick, I'll just uh, I did take a visit out to 50 Waltham Street. Um, oh, yeah and did see that there, there are clearly some water and moisture issues, uh, some of which pertain to drainage. Uh, I'd say just for the purposes of this discussion, if nobody takes any issue, I'd like to work a little bit with Kevin and DPW to pull some additional information. I have no problem with that. That, that gentleman has been here uh, before the board at least once if not twice in the past um, and I remember once we got some video I don't know Kevin if you remember when we got the video uh, of some of the flooding that he saw and it looks like some of it and uh, I know you guys all being engineers have a much better understanding of, of this than I but it's it certainly looks like some of what the town has done o over the years has led to an increase in some of his issues. But I don't I could be wrong. That's just the way it appears. Um, at least that's certainly what he claims, and he's claimed it for a number of years. I think the biggest impact of that property is the the neighbor who's asphalted his entire backyard, and 
I, I, or pitches and drains. I mean, there may be some other. But isn't the parking lot there raised the as lot, well, like and that comes wall. down? But the uh, the biggest point is that back corner of his neighbor's property as well, which is, you know, at one point they were running a a uh, illegal commercial operation out of there, and they've they've been essentially put asphalt and paved their entire backyard. It's like a. And I remember at one point Mike I think Sullivan. There's a point in the back there that's creating a little bit of. There's look just based, based on the based on the report a, um, a manhole cover or something that was. Yeah, out I mean, there, based on just being out there, there's a number of issues, and that's why I don't want to. Yeah. To bring it up now, I don't want to. I don't want to throw it out here. Give it short shrift. So, Jason, two questions. Um, sure. If you did your your research, would you have some findings for our next meeting? Sure. And how much staff time do you think you're going to chew up? Honestly, Bill, most of it is looking for, you know, the gentleman question had indicated some things were forwarded to the town, and there's been some filings or some complaints issued. I I'm looking for those. Uh, also been told that along with, I believe, the Oriental Delight Project, that there's been some investigation of the drainage system. Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to get a hold of that. I mean, effectively, I'm thinking... You know, there, there's a handful of things we need to look at. You know, just verifying that thing that you know any town appurtenances drains are, are open and functioning. The catch basins are working. You know, I, I actually ran out during the m monsoonal rains a few weeks ago because I figured it was a really good time to go out and take a look. Um, I did not at the time see any street flow entering the property. Uh, but it wasn't particularly easy to see if you know, the, the neighboring issues were apply, you know, were shedding flow. I certainly couldn't see how the drains were functioning. Right. So, yeah, my, all I've heard is that you know it's flowing continuously, 365 days a year into the river. There's water coming out of that. Yeah, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that you know any redevelopment over there is necessarily a that may actually be a good thing for mm -hmm. the situation and the, the drainage, but. It might be worthwhile taking a look at that. So I'm still just trying to get an idea of how much staff time you need. I mean, is it two hours or 20 hours? I think it's more like two hours. Do Kevin, is it something? Yeah, you can handle on next week. Or two? It's worth exploring. It's an issue that uh, it's an issue that's touched every department, <laughs> um, and it continues to you know drain on staff time there. You know, no matter how many times the uh, conservation agent tells them it's a non-issue or the building commissioner they've still have been out there three or four times general and time frame it, for documents for the last time he was here was probably four to five years ago the same packet that the board of selectmen received as did all of those departments just to be clear yeah i mean we've i don't know if the pack that we received this time was exactly the same it was, it was a little bit different right, than the prior years yeah but yeah. there was also that video yeah, I don't I know if we really kept that somewhere, but uh, we'll have to look for it. All right, so Jason, sounds like that's fine for you to do a little exploring. I would just caution that if you find yourself getting in too deep and requiring too much staff resources, you slow down a bit. That's fair. Okay. Anything else? Uh, nope. I think that's it. I'll defer to Brendan. All right, Brendan. So. On August 14th, we, we have our goals meeting, um, which we started to talk about, um, you, know, a little, you know, a little bit what we're discussing. I know you're assembling the agenda. I'm going to offer to you that I think while discussing goals is an important thing, I think discussing how this board can actually practically work together is more critical. Without that fundamental basis, um, then achieving goals is rather problematic. I'm going to offer to you that um, even other committees in town, and, I'm, and I haven't done a, a heck of a lot of research, but even look, our colleagues on the school committee have a, have a code of conduct, a code of civility. And I would offer to you that the actions of my colleague, Selectman Gavin, on July 8th crossed over 
any reasonable lines that could be established for civility. Regardless of the merits of the points being made, I cannot characterize Selectman Gavin's behavior as anything other than bullying and intimidation. Now, Selectman Capella's um, desired uh, choice to resign is hers, and that's fine. But if in future discussions of 129 Parker Street, we're going to see similar sort of um, actions, then I'm not sure how this board can work together, and I don't care what goals we set, we're not going to be able to achieve them. All right. I guess we got another agenda item for that meeting. Fair enough. You have anything else? Have. Nope, that's it. All right. Um, that's it. Sorry. I couldn't make it stick till 9 o'clock. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Adjourning at. Uh,